Perfect. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm calling the I'm calling the meeting to order at six seventeen p.m. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to today's meeting on November 16, twenty twenty one. This meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available on our PRNC YouTube page, as well as our website, prnc.org. All meeting attendees will be automatically muted when they join the meeting. Attendees may address the board in one, or one of two situations. Number one, comment on an agenda item, or number two, provide a general public comment. After each agenda item is read out loud and before a board vote is taken on that item, if any, I will ask if any member of the public wishes to address the board regarding the agenda item being considered. At that time, the meeting attendees can electronically raise their hand to speak. This is done as follows. If you are attending the meeting using a telephone only, or if you are attending the meeting via a computer or tablet, but still using a telephone for audio, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone. That will prompt the present presiding officer that you wish to speak. If you are attending the meeting using computer or tablet only, and thus using com computer or tablet built-in microphone, then you raise your hand by using the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will see that you wish to speak. I will go down the list of those who have their hands raised, turn on their audio one at a time, and ask him or her to go ahead, provide public comment with a specific period of time. When a speaker's time expired, I will let the speaker know that her or his time has expired, thank them for their comment, and turn off the audio for that speaker. This process will continue until all attendees who raised their hand spoke. At that time, the board will discuss the motion and take a vote if they choose so. The general, for general comments, public comments, as noted in the meeting agenda, there is an item dedicated to public comments on items not on the agenda but within the purview of the board. When the item comes up during the course of the meeting, I will ask if any member of the public wishes to address the board regarding any issues that are not on the agenda, but is within the domain of the board's actions and capabilities. At that time, the meeting attendees can electronically raise their hand to speak using the same procedures described above. Please note that under the Brown Act, the board will be prevented from discussing or acting on a matter that is brought to its attention during the general public comment period. However, the issue raised by the member of the public may become the subject of a future board meeting. Public comments is limited to two minutes per speaker unless adjusted by the presiding officer at his or her discretion. Secretary, uh, you want the roll call, please? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we do. Oh, perfect. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties with my camera and everything. So bear with me tonight. No problem. Okay. Uh, David Lasher. Here. David Balin. Hilda Sarkeesian. Here. Jason Hector. I'm here. Louise Ramirez. Becky Levesque. Here. Brandy Grace. Present. Jennifer Ibrahim. Here. Voss Singh. Here. Myself, Christine Demerchin, present, and Gabriel Canlian. I am here. Thank you. Perfect. And I believe we have quorum. Yes, we do. I appreciate that, Christine. You're welcome. Uh, let's move on to the next item, Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone may stand up. Be stand, put your right hand over your heart, ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Let's move on to the next item, agenda item, which is uh, President's comments. First of all, I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight's annual retreat. We'll be discussing our committee's plans for 2022 
and we are here to listen to your ideas and comments. Originally, we had a lot on the agenda, which was going to cause a lengthy meeting, but I wanted to focus on the future of PRNC to bring the community closer and more involved. So I'm calling a special meeting on the 22nd of this month to cover all the other business, which is going to include public official updates, Aliso Canyon updates, and financial updates. So I hope everyone can make it on 22nd, which is next week. Uh, I also know that we're going to be continuing meetings on Zoom. I hope next year we can go hybrid or in face-to-face -face because I believe face-to-face -face discussions are a lot more productive than just Zoom. But we shall see what next year brings. I also want to thank Shepherd of the Hill or Shepherd Church for their wonderful tree lighting ceremony uh, last week. And I look forward to the menorah lighting on the 30th of this month. The tree lighting in Granada Hills is on the December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. And the Granada Hills Parade is on December 5th. On another note, I am still having communications, uh, speaking with some of the board members. I want pretty much, I need everyone to get together and uh, reply to emails so we can conduct business efficiently. And I hope that everybody starts providing agenda items in the future instead of a handful of people. Um, for example, for the Granada Hills, we had to cancel the Granada Hill Street Fair booth that, uh, about a couple of weeks ago because we did not have enough board members participating, not even for an hour. I was not going to let a handful of board members set up and run the booth all day, which we all voted as a team. And nor was I going to allow stakeholders or my kids to run the booth and volunteer as this was PRNC's booth. And without board members, it, it, there's no point. Being on the board requires much more time than just showing up to meetings and leaving. Uh, last, I want to clarify the agenda posting process, as this meeting was being challenged by former President David Balin to the city, alleging that proper notice was not given and we should cancel immediately. Unfortunately for him, but fortunate to us, I know how to follow the rules and we were in compliance. All notices were posted and announced prior to 24 hour notice deadline. Today's meeting is a special meeting which requires 24 hour notice. Agenda was sent to NC support for posting at 2 a.m. on the 15th, and it was posted on their website and emailed around noon. Also, the meeting was today, obviously, at 6.15 p.m. on the 16th. Also, it was, the agenda was posted before the 24 hour deadline on our board, as well as our webpage. General meeting requires 72 hour notice prior to a meeting. Uh, which means we got to do all the posting before 72 hours. And uh, that includes posting it on Corbin Avenue, sending the PDF copies to NC support for the email blast, as well as our website. Special meetings like this one is 24 hours prior to, prior to the meeting. Just want to clarify that. Uh, let's move on to the next item, which is public comments on items not on the agenda and within the purview of the board. Hey, Gabriel. Yes, sir. I had my hand raised before. I just want to be uh, make it clear for the record. Uh, I was supporting yeah. the Gypsy Fair, but I was in Maryland and Delaware during the period that was held. I was out of state. No problem at all. I couldn't have attended. I was in Delaware for 10 days. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, what I'm going to do in the future is uh, when we call a vote for an event like that, maybe we should discuss it at the meeting and find out who can attend. That way we can have a breakdown instead of setting something up and having to cancel it. I know emergencies come up. It did happen this time around, but I'm hoping we can set up a core group so we can know that we'll be at the event and be strong. And if more show up, the better at that point. Thank you, though, David. Uh, do we have any stakeholders? We do have one. Uh, Asad, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Gabriel. Good evening, board members evening. and stakeholders and looking forward to a successful retreat this evening. I have a very a small uh, suggestion, and hopefully when you get you know, along the line as you progress the next few months to consider it, uh, I feel you need to add something like an interfaith com uh, committee that addresses uh, equity, addresses the um, interfaith and to work with the other groups, meaning the church, the mosque, and the synagogue to get things going. 
uh, historically, when I was on the board, I was doing that off on my own. But I feel it's a point, it would be impressive for PRNC to have such a committee. So hopefully along the line, it's on your radar to do it. Beside that, uh, looking forward to this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Azad. Any other public comments? Please raise your hand. If there are no more public comments, let's move on to the next agenda. Actually, we do have, we have Glenn Bailey. Ah. Floor is yours, Glenn. Uh, thank you. Uh, I didn't see budget advocates on the agenda, so i just do it really quick. I lost Brian already did it. Uh, no, you can go ahead. I have it added the budget advocates on the 22nd. <clears throat> we have a special meeting, but you can say something real quick right now. Um, I'm sorry, 22nd of... That's our, our next meeting, Glenn. Uh, uh, okay. Then uh, it's okay. I'll just wait then. You sure. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Any other public comments? Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> and next is item number seven, presentation by Gibson regarding Core Institute training in module two. Are you okay there, Mr. President? Yes, thank you. Hey, don't joke, don't joke right now, don't joke right now. This, this is too much important of a day. We do that. So please drink your water, good sir. Hi, everybody. Um, I am your NEA. Uh, again, my name is Gibson Yambura. Um, happy Tuesday, everybody. I'm um, hoping you guys are had a good day. So the reason I am on the agenda, just want to touch, uh, just do a quick. Um, so in the neighborhood council has been doing a leadership uh, core institute training in the, in the past six months. Uh, we had the, this um, doc, um, um, module two on October. Uh, 28th and I definitely just wanted to touch base in regards just kind of do a quick overview and an overview of what was being discussed give me a second I'm trying to get this uh, up and rolling um, um, Mr. Chair can you let me sh a screen share uh sure yeah I think you should have access you don't have access yet uh, you know, you have it disabled. Let me check one second. I did it. You did it? Okay. Are you good now? Try it. Yes, yes, I am good. Um, so I want to touch base just on a couple of things, right? Um, I want to do a quick, not a quick, but just kind of go through a summary of what was being discussed um, in our neighborhood, in the core institute. And this is where it first started, actually. Let me it, the first court institute, it was led by our, one of our directors of innovation. Um, and the whole presentation is, it's a bit long, but I want to touch on a couple highlights. Um, I want to touch base on the neighborhood council bylaws, especially, um, I want to touch base on bylaws, right? Um, one thing about um, the bylaw structure is, uh, is detailed in charter section 906, which, um, talks about the purpose of the bylaws. And in the charter, one thing is the bylaws are being governing by, uh, documents that are included in the city charters as I, uh, on the screen. Um, and this, this section has the minimum requirements re regarding the context of the bylaws, right? Um, one thing that budget bylaws is talking about the method by which your offices are chosen, the neighborhood council uh, membership being open to everyone who lives or works and owns property in the area. Assurances that members of the neighborhood council reflect the diverse interests within the area. Um, a system through which the neighborhood council will communicate with stakeholders on a regular basis. A system of accountability for its funds and guarantees all meetings are public. I think one thing we always want to make sure is everybody always assumes that, I think the training was not going on assumption that everybody is experienced and understands the neighborhood council process, but rather just an indication that everybody um, we are kind of going back and forth. I mean, we for people who are returning to the board, they are one relearning some of the things they've already known, but just kind of giving a Q uh, a Q and A on and just coming on the bylaws, right? Um, and what are the bylaws, right? It's one of the situations where it is a public document. I wanted to uh, reiterate that. 
Um, some people think it should be much shorter and remain macro and not run into details. But one thing in our, in my experience, we always ask that we always try to provide as much detail and context between your bylaws. Um, and sometimes if your bylaws don't have enough context, having standing rules goes a long, long way. Um, just kind of adding on to that. I think one thing is, as our boards continue to have be a diverse workplace. I consider this like a workplace. Sometimes you guys are each other's colleagues, um, just making sure that we are diverse, we are professional to one, one another. And sometimes even if you don't disagree with people, just making sure that it provides a context for civic engagement. Civic engagement means we don't have to, in my experience, it doesn't mean that we agree with each other, but it's also we are within a um, lineage to which we are able to be respectful of each other's views and opinions. And that's why we use the, it, we use that as one of the documents. Yes, Mr. Lash, I see you has your hand, hand up. I'm just going to wait till you finish, but I think we definitely need to address the bylaws. If we're not going to have, uh, if we're having issues where people are fraudulently getting business registrations just to get on a council or be able to run, if we're not going to be able to investigate that, there's got to be something in the bylaws that would enhance an ability to do that. If we're not going to, if the city attorney is going to bow out and the city clerk is going to bow out, everybody's going to bow out, and they all say that there's no process, we need to develop a process so that when something like that does come up, it can be investigated. Instead, you're saying, oh, well, they showed us a driver's license, or oh, well, they showed us a business registration. We're obviously not cops or you know DAs, but some methodology, simple, if there is a dispute, it shall be done this way, that kind of thing, so that there's actually something in the bylaws that we can hang our hat on. Message received. I think one thing I definitely touch base on is just making sure that the bylaws also help the neighborhood council stakeholders um, understand the process to which the neighborhood council works. I think one thing is just giving folks an assurance as to is there a process, a system that operates within the neighborhood council system, and that's why the bylaws always go a long way. Um, kind of just kind of touch base. One thing that uh, we'd like to touch base upon is the hierarchy of doctor governing bodies is looking at all the policies. Yes, the United States Constitution is always at the top, but I wanted to uh, emphasize everything from the city laws, right? And when it comes to city policies and elect a city and municipal code, um, it always over, uh, they always over, um, stump bylaws and policies, right? Bunk policies. Whenever a city, a piece of city uh, council legislation is being voted on, Something like the anti-bias training, right? It's not just a mandate that comes from the board of neighborhood commissioners. No, it's a citywide policy that's mandated to all city members of the city family, right? So that includes the neighborhood council board members. So one thing I always like to touch base upon is sort of the hierarchy to which bylaws stand when it comes to different capacities, right? And how the standing rules also, so they, are, they are supplemental to the NC bylaws. That's why I always like to make sure that give folks, hey, making sure that if you feel as though something is missing with your NC bylaws and um, the process to which bylaw amendments is closed at the moment, create standing rules, start that discussion, operating procedure, make sure that we have a process to which, um, to which we're able to make sure just like a piece of policy is missing, right? That's why we are consistently working within the department to try to improve a lot of these processes, right? That's why we're trying to do a, um, um, on our end, uh, when you go back a little bit, just uh, when you take a look at bunk policies, right? That's why we are asking our neighborhood council board members to provide an input on something like our um, the bunk policy procedure that's being discussed. So just kind of sidetracking a little bit. One thing I want to touch base upon is also on our website, we have updated um, the ability for everybody to see which, um, what, community impact statements have been submitted on the bonk policies. So as you know, bonk is taking upon the code of conduct, um, the social media, the, the social media draft policy, um, and all those things we have been able to quantify as to how, which neighborhood council is taking sort of an initiative on which, um, on board of neighborhood commissioner policies. So if you want to take a look at which NC took action, we've been able to um, sort of detail them on our website. And then we also detail which policy matter to which uh, the, each neighborhood council has taken action upon. So always want to make sure that you know that this is on our website. It's something that we finally worked on. Um, and that's why I always encourage our boards to always be in, um, 
in line and just always communicating or discussing what's just being discussed by Bonk. So at least make sure that your dis input is very important. Are you Even if you're against or in support of something like the digital media, media policy, there's definitely some neighborhood councils who are definitely against it or some are for it. That is your ability to provide input on it or maybe, hey, we will su support it or uh, su will be supporting or against it if amended and all that sort of board action. So please just kind of kind of keep that in, in line. It, it's always helpful, right? Because the engagement goes in different capacities and we want to make sure that we are able to work on on that on that on that um, on that area. Give me one second to make sure my mic is okay. Seems like my mic is having a problem. We can hear you fine, Gibson. You're doing good, my friend. Thank you. So let's continue on a little bit, right? Um, so one thing we always like to touch base on is what is included in your bylaws. I was like, we liked the culture within the department is always feel free to look at different neighborhood councils, right? Um, always feel free to take a look at them. If you guys want me to send you a list of NCs, which I look at their bylaws, and sometimes you want to do a comparison. One thing I was going to also touch base upon is your table of contents cannot be modified per the bond policy, and it's standard across the 99 neighborhood councils. So if there's a section to which you feel as though the language doesn't suffice to this board, just just uh, leave the section blank or just say this policy does not, um, does not, uh, what's the wording? It does not, uh, it is not applicable to this board. So you can keep it blank. Just do not take a section out. It's just something that um, can, is not modified across the board. Um, Want to go into boundaries a little bit, right? Um, so the department take, did an assessment in 2018 um, to which we were looking at street names. We, we the, the purpose of this review was to clarify the language and also con, uh, uh, clean any mishaps and all uh, and just do clean up all potential overlapping um, boundaries, considering a lot of entities were sharing locations like public facilities, metro stops, the subway. For example, I had an issue in Studio City and North Hollywood, um, one of the neighborhood councils from Hollywood, I think it's Hollywood Hills West. They also, they put one, the same map, uh, the Metro at Universal Studios, right? We, we had an issue there and it was on one board's bylaws, but it was not on the other. But when you take a look at the boundaries, it shows that the map was included in that. And we always wanted to make sure that we help clean that. So, um, so if you're already, uh, if you're not a, if you're on the board, then you you should have you uh, you did receive a notification to let you know that there was any def, um, the notice about the definition of your boundaries using street names and uh, cardinal directions. Also, one thing is one of my boards was using zip codes and census line census uh, uh, yeah census census codes. What what the problem is using a census block or tract is it changes every ten years. So we always want to make sure that the bylaws stay within the description of the street name. Let's say if there's a street name change too, we always want to make sure that we consider that. But the one problem we always run into is a census track or block. That always becomes an issue because, again, it adapts. And now that the census has been conducted, the census track is going to look very, very different. And so if your bylaws have a census track from, um, from let's say, 10, 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, it is not the same. And so we have to, we had to go back into the bylaws and ask our boards uh, to rename them into a street using street names and uh, cardinal directions. I'll be honest with you, if someone who has a problem with Northeast, West, South, mm, mm, that was a struggle for me. So I definitely- We're good on that, Gibson. We did that huh? already. Our, our bylaws are, our, I mean, our boundaries are real simple. We did it already. It's Perfect. basically the so two canyons and the freeway and then everything north of there. Perfect. So one thing that we were able, which was a good thing, was we were just able to simplify the description process. So I'm glad, Jason, you remember that. But for some of the new board members who are new to it, we definitely and the state some and stakeholders were here. I just wanted everybody to know the process was uh, op applicable to a lot of folks. And just so folks can just be be in tune, right, in this in discussion. Um, stakeholders, right? Um, so as everybody know, um, the art, uh, this article cannot be amended, right? As a definition of stakeholder has been approved by the city council, as I mentioned, right? The city administrative code, when the city council takes action, that's not, it's completely outside of our purview of you know, being able to change that um, description. So 
Um, if anybody wants to, I'll send that information. So the city administrative code, it kind of goes into it into detail. And this is where it talks about a community interstate holder, right? Being an individual who's a member of the, or who participates, a member of who participates in a community organization as defined in subsection C of the section. This is what is in the city administrative code when it comes to the neighborhood council stakeholder, the definition that is detailed in the city code. So I definitely wanted to um, everybody to be get from familiar with it. The section code is section 22.801.1 um, for folks who are just listening into the meeting, but everybody who's watching it, you see the, the code that's listed. And this is when in 2019, the city took action to provide um, a definition on the stakeholder, right? And you can see that we've detailed it here. Um, we, we provide sort of how stakeholders in terms of where they live, where they work and where they own property. Also um, a community interest stakeholder and also community organization, we added that. Um, and that language was something that we had, um, we had incorporated in some of our neighborhood councils. So the, we had to go back and do the bylaw amendments to which we, um, last year we definitely went ahead and made some changes. So if you see that's not, something that's incorrect, please let me know. Um, also within the article five of your governing body gives a description of the seats, right? Each neighborhood council has its own composition, um, right? And so one thing just to kind of note is the city council took action on the youth representation on the board, right? Your board can have up to one youth representative. The city administrative code provides rules regarding the eligibility to run for the seat. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see that later, right? Um, also, one, I want to emphasize something, right? According to, accordingly, no single stakeholder group shall comprise a majority of the council, right? One thing about the neighborhood council process is just making sure to which um, we are welcoming to all Angelinos, right? Every member of the, within this community is, has the ability to participate within the neighborhood council process, even uh, those we consider homeless or unhoused. They are able to participate within the neighborhood council process. Um, there is a way to which we may be, we are able to incorporate them into the neighborhood council process as they are members of our community and they are Angelinos, right? Um, <clears throat> one thing about the governing body is making sure that um, they can't, uh, not having a floating number, making sure that the minimum member present for holding a meeting, which is quorum, right? This is this number of, uh, has consequences and maximum numbers on committees. So this is where we get into the composition of quorum of quorum, right? Uh, what's the quorum of this board? Quorum of six. Six, right? So your committees, what is usually recommended is making sure that um, you have up just up to three members of each uh, board members and each committee. You want to make sure you don't get it uh, past that because you don't want to get into issue of the quorum of a quorum because it looks like um, that number ends up being an issue. Yes, Jason. Oh, what I, I never understood what a stakeholder group is. It's such a vague term. Can you explain and give some examples? Is Are you saying like a homeless person is a stakeholder group or a senior would be a stakeholder group or would that be somebody affiliated with an organization or? So uh, when you take a look at the city administrative code, Right. It, it, this is the guideline that we're going on. This is we going off of the city administrative code. Right. Um, it gives a definition about who lives, works, or owns property within the boundaries of the neighborhood council. Right. Uh, any individual who's in a community interest stakeholder. So, and we have a de it's it's defined there as well. And also community organizations. Right. They are an entity uh, that continuously maintains a physical address within the boundaries of the neighborhood council. And also. Um, one thing we also, within the city administrative code, it uh, states that a for-profit entity cannot, can, uh, cannot shall not qualify as a community organization. So you wanna make sure that we are sort of within the guidance of the city administrative code, because what's the thought process about um, a stakeholder group? I just wanna ask that question. Well, I'm trying to get an interpretation. I'm not asking for like you to recite it. What I'm saying is like, is, is a homeless, individual considered a stakeholder group or is a, it says community organization. So would, would a member of a church be considered part of a stakeholder group? I'm trying mm -hmm. to get like some examples. Jason, uh, yes, yeah, so a member of a church like can be have, part of, yeah. Yes. I think he means like if you had like say Puerto Ranch being a majority of the board members were from one organization. 
or like exactly. one if it's like group of folks who are all homeowners right like one thing that is discouraged is like people who are mostly business owners right um yeah a member of a church is also a community organization that does qualify um that's that's how we've always, we've interpreted in that capacity right also like to uh, touch base is like yes the person may be unhoused but they may be part of an organization within the within your neighborhood council boundaries that provides services to those unhoused right there's different ways they one thing I always like to remind everybody, we're multifaceted beings, right? So yes, that person may be considered um, unhoused, but maybe they're part of your local church. Um, maybe they're part of the local full shed, shelter, all those different variances. It, it's not just one so it's capacity not, that defines. It's not that it's, so their, their status, their housing status is not, an, is not it, it's what organization they would, anybody's affiliated with basically. Yes. All right, thank you. Brandy has her hand up, Brandy. Uh, I'd also like to point out when, it, when we talk about residency, an unhoused individual, if an unhoused individual lived on the corner of my street here, they can register that as their legal address. So then they would be considered a living resident in our community. So they can be a resident even if they are unhoused. Just Thank know. you. Appreciate that, Brandy. Um, so just want to, I definitely don't want to take too much time. I definitely want to see, um, want to continue on a little bit. Um, so we also have Hilda have her, has her, has her hand up. Who has her hand up? Hilda. Hilda, Hi. did you, have, oh, Can sorry, you about that. I didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't hear uh, the answer for Brandy because mine is similar. If there is an individual living um, intersection of Northwest corner uh, under a tent, so that's considered somebody that can come in and do what we're doing here. They if, are, if they've legally registered that with, like, like how that's can you register do. if you're a homeless? How can you register your your tent there? Sorry, sorry, Gibson. I work with. Uh, if you, if like, for example, to vote, you can legally register to vote or to get a driver's license, a street corner as your place of residence in order to fulfill those requirements. So at that point, they are legally considered registered as living at that space as a resident. And then they can, they can vote then at that time. So then they'd be able to vote or run for their local NC that, wow. that corner wow. is within. We need to work on this. Okay, thank you. It, you let me, let me touch base something on Ms. Hill. The one thing that the neighborhood council process is designed to be welcoming to every Angelino. So in that process of saying need to work on it, please understand that you may run into a problem of disenfranchising others from participating within the process. One thing about the neighborhood council process, it is designed to be welcoming of all stakeholders. Hmm. Okay. We'll discuss that later. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Levesque. Um, also, uh, for the homeless, if they have a social worker, they can register um, their address at a bus stop um, and they can legally live there and legally live on the corner. So there's a lot of things that we all need to rethink in the city on how to deal with this. Thank you. Fantastic. So I think because I want to finish in 10, 10 minutes, uh, because I definitely know the agenda is pretty long and this is a lot of stuff to go through. So if I cut it short, Please forgive me. Okay. Um, definitely want to touch on. Um, there's a not. Give me a second. Uh, I want to touch base on something that's really important right now. It's amendments, right? So right now, bylaws can be amended. Um, and we have up until April 2022. I always like to remind, get my boards to start running, uh, get the ball rolling in terms of ma making any bylaw amendments. Um, so one thing about bylaw amendments is they do take a, a while. So whenever um, a new board is elected and everybody gets comfortable, what I like to try to remind folks is like, hey, can we get the conversation? Are there any parts of the bylaws you want to make amendments by? Um, the bylaw amendment process is one thing to which um, it, it usually some NC board members ends up agendizing at least to two regular board meetings It sometimes is not addressed in one because there's so many changes that we need to make within the bylaws. Um, one thing that I just want to touch base on if you are making a board structure change like if you're adding a, a board seat or changing it from one category to another 
that is a board amendment that does need to get approved by the board of neighborhood commissioners, right? Um, I always want to make sure that I'm working with my board whenever the, the bylaw amendments begin. So if Mr. President, if there's going to be an, a committee and members, just invite me and I'll definitely want to make my due diligence as, as the department is hiring uh, about four staff members in the next few weeks, we'll be able to at least uh, slow down our workload and we can get the ball rolling in um, me joining the committees, ask, answering questions if folks have it. Is, the, can this bylaw amendment be changed? And yes, no, why it can't. So I can just be able to be, be of assistance through the process. Perfect. Thank you. We'll um, definitely invite you. Right. So if you have a board structure change or a boundary adjustment, it does need to be this uh, needs to go to the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners for uh, a discussion and approval. And a representative for your neighbor council is approved, uh, is, uh, and it's a, I meant to say, a representative from your neighbor council is invited to participate in the neighbor council process. Right. Any other amendments are approved by the department. So once they are am amended, I'm able, we're able to send out uh, um, an updated bylaw, just kind of give answers and all that good stuff. That's why I need every bylaw. Let's see if I can get a chance to. Um, please don't mind my workflow. This is just how I like to work with my boards. I like to. No worries. Uh, so when you take a look at each bylaw, right? So one thing about each bylaw is. It has a provision, right? The date to which it was last updated. Uh, this helps us make sure that we keep track of each amendment per time, especially as an NEA. If you don't give a good track, you end up misguiding the board where they end up working with two or three copies of their bylaw amendment. So we always make sure that um, the bylaw amendment process is a very detail oriented process to which we make sure everything is approached on time, making sure that it's properly done because you want to make sure that it's properly detailed. And also I like to, we like to have it at the bottom, right at the top, at the bottom, every other just kind of details as much information as possible. Compliance, right? Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Jason, do you have a question? When you're done, I just want to make a comment. Okay. Um, you, you go ahead. I'm just you to go ahead. I mean, I, want I just, to, I want to jump base on another. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to say, you know, um, before the new board came in, we had a few meetings for bylaws and um, we made quite a bit of progress, but, you know, Assad was um, the chair and then he's not on the board anymore, but I just want to encourage and agree with Gibson that, you know, doing the standing rules would be a good first step just to get it going. And, you know, uh, Voss Singh is the chair of bylaws, Gibson, just so you know, and then, you um, you know, we, we made some progress and so we don't necessarily have to start from zero, but when we did the bylaws last time and it worked well, we had a special meeting and all we talked about was bylaws. And I think that's really the best way to do it. Um, you know, boss, I would highly recommend just doing a meeting on, let's just do one thing. Like if you do standing rules, that's all we're doing. And then, you know, we do it, hash it out for an hour or two. Um, and I think we got it done in like two or three meetings um, last time with ESOM handling it. So anyways, those are my comments. I agree. Standing rules. Um, so, yeah, so uh, bylaw process, right? We always want to make sure. Uh, I have in a this question. Previous... Gibson. Oh. Yes, Mr. Singh. Okay. I just want to answer to Jason that uh, at this time, I think... Uh, the bylaws amendments are the main priority. Standing instruction we can do any time. So we should leave that after the bylaws are amended. So I like that idea. Yeah. Okay, so kind of chugging along good folks. So we have a, we, we went through the bylaw amendment. Um, I will send a, a different copy. I will send a follow-up email after this meeting or during this meeting uh, to which we, we, the department in partnership with the office of the city clerk and the office of the city attorney have updated the bylaws uh, template. So they'll, I will do a follow-up email in regards to that template. So everybody can take a look at what we worked on. It definitely has some highlights on it. Um, right. It just has the usual, the required table of contents, right. Uh, sections that are mandated by the city council or bunk, right. Sections are de developed by your board. And then, then the, the section to which in the template, we added some recommendations we felt as though uh, would work a standard across the neighborhood council process system. Um, so for us, as everybody know, we're still virtual. Um, in accordance to AB 361, um, the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners will be taking action 
uh, every 30 days to make sure that the, they do a, a, a vote to continue um, to either continue setting up virtual meetings or figuring out how to do a physical and physical meeting. Uh, the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners took action yesterday. Um, just want to make sure that uh, they took action yesterday and the, uh, the board will continue on doing virtual meetings at the moment. So if there's any going to be any changes, um, we'll definitely touch base on that, right? Want to touch base on um, give me a second uh, on the EVG process, right? So the uh, Empower LA Virtual Governance Protocol uh, is a guide for neighborhood councils to hold public meetings in a virtual setting while adhering to the uh, state of California and County of Los Angeles. Sort of all the regulations from all our states, uh, from all levels of government while we, uh, while we are still in this pandemic. Um, the EVG protocol, right? It's a set of protocols uh, providing guidance and recommendations on different aspects of holding neighborhood council meetings, right? In terms of access to the meetings, roles in a virtual meeting, right? The parliamentary procedure in a meeting and kind of some of the updates that were included in AB 361 that I mentioned in the previous board meeting. Uh, one thing I just wanna to touch base upon is the department provides only one Zoom license per neighborhood council. Uh, the board does provide, is consistently providing technical training and support to using Zoom. And also there's unlimited storage in your recordings, right? We recommend just do it virtual. On the setting, keep it on the cloud. Don't let it download because the download, once there's one that, that download, it's one copy. The thing about holding and the, the storage of your recordings in the cloud, it's easy to share it. It's just a, a web link that's easy downloadable, uh, easy to just download, and it's just easily inaccessible. Um, it's in. It's on our website. Uh, it's e, uh, Empire LA, um, EmpireLA.org slash EVG. So, um, um, one thing I want to touch base on is also right. We have all the proper documents to which um, they do this right. So we have all the we have the toolbox. We have the EVG toolbox, the outreach, all that good stuff, right? We also have the parliamentary procedure to which is accessible to everybody. Um, as you ever know, we had worked with us. Robert's rules made simple and you can create an account and just kind of get the information and the run through on doing, um, do, being able to just kind of get familiar with doing a, a parliamentary procedure. So going on to the next thing, right? Um, the license holder, right? So each person uh, is assigned the license to one board member and just access to, to the back end of Zoom, right? So um, this is ability to set Zoom webinars. One thing I like to touch base upon on, on your all your meetings, committee meetings and light and board meetings, sending them, setting up them up to be recurring. They keep the same meeting, uh, meeting ID number. So it's just easier for you to always be consistent in putting it on the agenda. Um, and just kind of being able to, um, what do you call it? Being able to do that is it simplifies the process for you. Um, being able to touch base on that board, and just being able to, um, when it comes to agenda creating, setting your agendas is always a procedure, and we want to make sure that we can come up with a better system of minimizing that. Um, so we always like to touch base about the capacities of the host and the moderator. We always like to say hosting a webinar is a two person team, right? We have the person who's leading the meeting and then the person who's going through the screen shares. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, you are, you have the host, the moderator, right? And the co-host. And so you're able to like, take a look at the moderator, look at the work, right? When you take a look at the example and the information, of the moderator, right? The ability to, um, they can host power to another panelist. That's why I always recommend having multiple co-hosts. Multiple co-hosts help, like if the host maybe ends up losing internet, the meeting um, is able to automatically go to a new host. Um, you wanna be able to talk, uh, this person has the ability to control their members ability of the public to talk. Uh, they also have the ability to promote attendees and panelists. They're able to mute panelists, they're able to lower hands and also set the interpretation. Some of my, several of my meetings to which um, I attend to, they always need interpretation. That's why it's always good to be a moderator. And sometimes from time to time, you can put me as your NEA, as your co-host, and I'm able to do the things in the back end. So I help my boards uh, get the ball rolling in that, in that matter. And so we, better, we can definitely figure this out. 
Um, so there is a document. It's um, again, it's in our empirela.org slash EVG and it's on the EVG two box. And this is where the protocol looks like. So we made sure that it is a running document that we are consistently updating, providing guidance uh, to which you're able to kind of just get a good, come on, there you go. So it, it helps you just, uh, come on, internet. Not right now. I, I, my internet is deciding to not get, show the full document. So this is how the document looks like, right? Um, it's one that is consistently being updated and you'll see what we add onto sort of their, um, on it. And we wanna make sure that everybody feels comfortable using our site, right? Um, we have a simple agenda, we have, um, there we go. This is also the, one of the big documents. So this is the EVG protocol recommended settings for Brown Act uh, meetings. Look at, uh, so take a look at that, right? So it's like, it, it goes into detail. So it's, a, it's kind of a lot, but it's, we are trying to be as detailed as possible when it comes to templates, right? It's, it's a lot, but it's, it's something that we've detailed as much as we can. We've run through all the Zoom settings and we provide department uh, recommendations, right? And we also try to update it as much as we can because we wanna make sure that the information is up to date and you're able to just be able to function as a board. Um, so I touched base on AB361 previously, and because I want to be respectful of everybody's time, uh, we already touched base on, on, on AB361, and I'm going to stop there, but just kind of see if anybody has any questions uh, for me, or is there anything you want to do a quick run through when it comes Mr. to Gibson. dialogue? Yes, can you actually uh, remind everyone about the anti-bias training and what it is? So... As you know, the, uh, the, the anti-bias training is, um, is a, the training that is, uh, how do I say, it? it's been mandated after the city council took action um, to which all members of, um, it's a mandatory training for neighborhood council board members to help promote equity and inclusion within the neighborhood council uh, system. And see members, they, have, they should have received a notice about the new training uh, in September. So ABLE training is only required for board members and it's not required for committee members. Um, the, training, um, the training is a requirement uh, for NC members and other city families since the mayor signed executive order 27. Um, <clears throat> so this is where the city council took a motion to include the device, it's called the diversity, equity and inclusion training um, known as, as well as, right, it's part of the uh, anti-bias training. And so that's why we wanna make sure that everybody is aware of that. I see, Brandy, uh, did you have your hands up? Yeah, um, I, I have a question about who do I contact to make sure I'm able to get access to what, whatever account I need now to do that training? Me, I will work on it. It's, okay. uh, it's the same one that we use for, um, it's the same one that we use yeah. for our um, for Your Cornerstone. Training, yeah. Right? Yeah, because I did I did those before and then I was off and now I'm back on. So <laughs> well, I'll, I'll follow up with you. We'll follow up to make sure you have access to thank it you. and then you'll be able to uh, get uh, get that training done. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Singh. Yeah. Any update on the st certificate status, Civic U? I sent you a follow up email just to um, we can talk about that offline. You sent it today. Uh, I just I'm working with my colleague, but I had a question. You completed all three, correct? Yes. Okay, so yeah, I will touch base with my colleague to make sure it's sent to you. So I'm working on that on the back end. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gibson, what happens? I know the deadline for the antibias training is the 30th of this month. What happens if it's not completed? Uh, the anti-bias training is something that we are asking that everybody uh, completed. I think it is not necessarily... Uh, if you don't do this or else, it's one of the things we're asking our neighborhood council board members to be accountable by, just making sure that we do the neighborhood council pro um, yeah. to be within the process. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Lasher. Uh, Gibson, I've taken, I actually teach that training for the city of Burbank, organize and teach it to all 1,400 employees. Uh, so I manage that every other year mm -hmm. um, in accordance with the state law. So that can, would that suffice if I provide that certificate? Mm -mm. Hey, okay. This is the one that's developed within the city of LA by the Department of Personnel. Okay. And done. That's probably, it's probably a step following the Could same. be similar, but I think there isn't a workaround here. Everybody's, uh, we got to do it through the, uh, the one that's provided from the city. 
Okay. Thanks. I'm glad I asked. Any other questions from Mr. Gibson? You can email um, communications at empowerla.org. And the guy's name is Kyle Stone, who sends the login information. Just, just send it my way, and then it'll, it'll just simpler. That's a, just send it any department issue, just send it my way. Uh, so we can make sure we can uh, get that addressed. Perfect. I guess with no other questions, thank you, Mr. Gibson, for all the updates. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. If we have any thank questions, I'll members. definitely ask you. Okay, I may jump off a little bit because uh, in about uh, 30 minutes, because I do have uh, greater to look like, but I'll be consistently coming back and forth. Sounds good. So you'll be here next 30 minutes? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All thank right, you. let's move on to our next agenda item, which is uh, assignment of chair committee chairs. I have two assignments today. Um, I want to make, I know I could have just assigned them straightforward, but I did turn them into a motion. So I want to make a motion to approve Brandy Grace as a chair of homelessness committee. I'll second that. Jason seconded it. Any uh, comments? I really want to do it again. <laughs> Any public comments? Are you accepting Brandy? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> accepting. Okay. All right. Let's, let's call a vote because we did a vote on the last few committee chairs. So let's just call a vote real quick on this one too. So it'll be consistent. Okay, perfect. Uh, David Lasher? Yes. Okay, David Balin is absent. Hilda Sarkeesian? Yes. Jason? Yes. Louise? Absent. Yes. Becky? Yes. Brandy? Uh, okay, of course not. Um, <laughs> she accepted. <laughs> Jennifer? Yes. Voss? Yes. I say yes as well. And Gabriel? Yes. Okay, we have majority. Congratulations, Brandy. Thank you all. Thank you. Next one is, uh, I wanna make a motion to approve Hilda Sarkeesian as the chair of education committee. I'll second Bye. that. Thank you, Becky. Uh, would you accept that, Hilda? Yes. Thank you. Any questions from the panelists? Any questions from the attendees? Neither or, all right. Uh, Christine, please call the vote. David Lasher. Sure. David Balin, absent. Uh, Hilda, we're passing on. Um, Jason? Yes. Louise is absent. Becky Levesque? Yes. Brandy Grace? Yes. Jennifer Ibrahim? Yes. Voss? Yes. Uh, myself, yes. And Gabriel Canley? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, approved. And again, congratulations, Hilda. Thank you to both of you. Uh, let's move on to the next item. Uh, I want to make a motion to approve Gabriel Callian, myself, as a second uh, cardholder. Do we I have a second on that? I second. Voss seconded it. The reason we're doing this is because there's been a lot of charges that we needed to make and bugging Jason for making website charges or domain charges, mailbox charges. All the time it's it's convenient to have at least two people that have the card right jason yeah you know gabriel's handling a lot of the back office stuff with the website and the, the hosting and all that um we're not really meeting we're not really doing events and stuff and so um you know i'm kind of processing all the payments and gabriel's uh handling a lot of the website and the email and all that stuff so um yeah i, I think it's a good idea at this time Thank you. Any questions from the board? Questions from the attendees? All right, Christine, call the vote, please. David Lasher. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. David yep. Balin, absent. Hilda Sarkeesian? Yes. Jason Hector? Yes. Louise Ramirez, absent. Becky Levesque? Yes. Brandy Grace? Yes. Jennifer Ibrahim? Yes. Boss Singh? Yes. Myself, Christine DeMerchant, yes. And Gabriel Camlian, uh, I don't, yes. can you vote for yourself? Yes. Okay. Approved. Thank you. Christine, Thank you, can you, for the note taker, can you just um, count the votes when you um, get a chance? It's like, nine. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is yeah, it's nine yes, two absent, just just in case. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. 
Excuse me, this is the note taker. I have a quick question. On yes. the first two votes, it was Hilda Sarkassian that passed. Yeah, Hilda Sarkassian, Sarkassian will be the education committee. Okay, so and she did. Brent, I think he's at, she's asking about the vote count, I believe, right? The, the, she passed on the first two votes, and I want it for clarification. Is that a pass or abstain, amended, unqualified? What was the... Pass meaning yes. Oh, oh, that was a yes. Okay, I'm so okay. sorry. No problem. Sounds good. Let's move on. Next item is item number 10, presentation by View Ridge Townhomes representatives to speak regarding the recent fires along the 118 freeway. Uh, yeah. This uh, gives, uh, Gabriel, I would like to recuse myself. I have a conflict of interest with this one. Thank you, Mr. Voss. Thanks. If you can just mute, get off and log, uh, turn off your screen and well, I'll call you or I'll message you as soon as you can come back. Um, who is a part of this panelist? Yeah, who can um, somebody raise your, is it, is it Susan? Um, that you want to? There we go. Susan, okay, yeah, let me promote you to panel this. Let's see, there we go. Okay. Okay, so if you want to share a screen, um, or I could pull up the pictures, I have the pictures you sent to the board, whatever you prefer. You should be able to speak. Go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, Susan. Now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Sorry. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And a special thanks, Jason. Thank you for the help that you've already given. It's just been very helpful. Um, we've had three fires in seven years, and this one's costing us about $28,000 to clean up. Um, they don't tend that Caltrans has not pended the freeway with the last fire. Um, they spent a lot of money putting down. Uh, landscape irrigation, which they never turned on. Okay. And they planted some trees, which never got watered and they died and they never cleaned the slopes. So someone came along this last time and apparently the fire department feels that it's arson because the same thing occurred in Sunland. Uh, two separate fires um, behind two separate parts of our complex that line the freeway. Um, it, I don't know what to say, except it's very frustrating since Caltrans doesn't seem to want to tend the freeway. And because when I moved here 40 years ago, they said, oh yeah, when the freeway's done, we're putting up a wall, which they never put up. They stopped, they did it in Simi and then they stopped. It's, it's complicated and it would take longer than five minutes to, to explain. But certainly we would love to have a wall because they're not gonna throw their cigarettes against a, a wall and it's not gonna light the hillside on fire. But in, in lieu of that, because there's no money for that there, I'm told or been told, um, just to have your support to get Caltrans to do what they ought to be doing all along and tend the freeway, you know, clean it out, do what you need to do. If you keep it just plain dirt, nobody's going to throw a match and expect it to start like, you know, like the, the foliage on fire. I sent requisition after requisition to Caltrans and they say, yeah, we got it, but I'm not sure they're going to follow up. And when they do follow up, they just plant stuff and don't water it and walk away for the next time. So there you have it. If we could get your support, just, just knowing that I've gotten information from Jason, which has been very helpful, and writing letters and to have your support would mean a lot. And we appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. Does any Thank board you. members have any questions for her? Susan, would you like me to share the pictures that you emailed the board so the um, stakeholders can see? It came from Nancy Chong. Yes, of course. Okay, I'll pull those up. I don't. I don't want to take too much time. I know. I believe me. I know long meetings. So. No problem. Uh, so here's the fire. We are relatively close. Um, this is a section of index section, which is a little further um, west, and there's there's a little leeway between the freeway slope and the units. Um, further down towards Wilbur, there's virtually no leeway between the units. There, there's some, but it's mostly on slope. There's some flat land here. Um, as I said, $28,000 to take, take down a couple of trees that were damaged and uh, to redo the landscape that was damaged. It's the second time we've had to replant this area. 
in, in uh, the last five years. It's the second time in this area. And we keep it clean and we keep it watered. But what are you gonna do when a dead pine tree goes up on the freeway side, it's gonna light up everything on our side. Very true. Becky, you have a question? Thank yeah, you. just a couple of things. First of all, how do we know that it was started by cigarettes? There, we don't know. Um, chances are, chances are at least one of those fires is because that's the most common cause. Somebody tosses a, a, a cigarette butt out the window. Um, they believe that this one was arson involved. Somebody just you know went along and tossed whatever they tossed out their window one place and then another place. But the cause, it, it's it's all the same. Whatever you know, it's you know, whether they throw a cigarette out or something else out, anything that lights that slope on is going to be the problem. But it wasn't caused by someone using it as their place of residence. No, there's no. Okay. No. And you the need other, the other, question, down there. the other, other thing I wanted to mention, Susan, um, we've had, I've been on the neighborhood council a very long time. And when we've had issues with the 118 freeway and the, and the area surrounding it, we've had very good luck working with our local assembly office. And uh, I know that uh, you know you're you're contacting the governor and all of that, but I think it would do you well if you made a personal phone call to our assembly member because I find them very receptive to this kind of thing. Just a suggestion. Done. Yes, done. Great, it's done. Good job. Well, believe me, that's all <laughs> I've been doing for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> well, yes. I, I take my hat off to you for taking this on. You're awesome. You're saving all of Porter Ranch. Thank oh you. gosh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question, Jason, go ahead. I mean, I, I'll just comment because this is a problem that we've been trying to, um, I put in so many maintenance requests with Caltrans and really, you know, the, the problem is that, that the condition is so full of brush and dead stuff that, you know, it's inevitable. It doesn't matter, you know, it's gonna start whether it's, you know, who knows how it's gonna start, but, you know, if, if they allow that dead brush to be there, it's inevitable at some point. And if you look all along the freeway, it's not just there. I mean, look at on Reseda. I mean, the fire on Amigo and Reseda yes. was huge. Mm -hmm. And that thing like crossed Rinaldi, you know, yeah. and that takes a lot to cross the street. So, you know, those pine trees need to be trimmed up. The top, the bottom third needs to be trimmed up. And down. everything needs to be within the fire code. So one way or another, you know, somebody's got to do it, you know, and, and, and that's my point. It just needs to get done. I don't know. I don't care how it gets done, but, you know, I'll, I'll help you as much as I can. And, you know, you, you have my, my support and I'm sure everyone else's. Um, thank you. We all, we all want to get this done. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I appreciate the work you do. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Becky, you have another question? Yeah, just um, just food for thought. This area has exploded as far as um, people moving in, homes being built. The tax base up here, the last time I, I, I was told that we generate more income than the city of Beverly Hills, wow. Porter Ranch. They need to put some of our tax money to work in our community so that the community doesn't burn up. And yeah. I think that we need to put a lot of pressure on them. And any help I can give you, Susan, I'm more than happy to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Anything from the attendees? Uh, we have one from Subrata. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, my name is Subrata Chakrabarti, and I'm actually a resident of um, View Ridge Townhomes, and I've been working very closely with Susan and the board, um, on the HOA board. HOA board. You know, hats off to them, you know, for staying on top of um, this crisis situation. I just wanted to um, give a little bit of a homeowner perspective uh, to what, what happened here. Um, you know, you mentioned the fire on Amigo and Rinaldi. That was terrible, of course, you know, but the difference between that one and this is that one and this fire was that was the proximity of the residents, uh, residences to this fire. You know, we had, I, you saw the fires in that picture. Uh, my home is right behind that huge pine tree that went up in flames. So we were about 20 or 30 feet away from the flames as they caught fire. We had a reaction time of minutes. 
uh, to get out our hoses and do, uh, you know, make our decisions. It took about 30 minutes for the fire truck to actually get through the barriers to the place where the fires were actually happening. So, um, you know, I think we were very fortunate that the outcome was the way it was. Uh, I think um, the issue, of course, uh, you know, in this particular case, there are so many houses that are close to that fire line. We, we do believe that this particular situation needs to be treated with um, a very high priority because of that reason. But I think there's also a global problem for Porter Ranch, as you have all mentioned, that, um, that this is not a question of just affecting our community, but I think across the board in Porter Ranch, we do need to get together and make a, make a common stand on this. Because I think in one way or the other affects us all. You know, we've all been affected by fire one way or the other. So uh, thank you for hearing me out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we have another speaker, Elliot. Floor is yours. Elliot? Oh, Elliot, unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. It should be on the bottom left. There you go. Okay. Yes, this is the third time in the last seven years that the same type of fires started along the 118 freeway. They start at the same time, at the same day, uh, about 300 yards apart. One closer to Wilbur and the other one closer to Tampa. So somebody is throwing something out of the window of the car as they drive by. Uh, and this has happened three times the same, exact same way. And, and these fires, these, these aren't all the pictures. I have a, quite a few pictures that I sent in, but evidently we weren't able to show them. Um, we had a, a helicopter drop, a, uh, a fire truck down there, uh, and they, they tore up the, uh, the fence, the property line fence between the freeway, which has to be repaired. But uh, it it's comes very close to some of the units. That's, that's about all I uh, care to say on the subject. Thank you, Elliot. We, we appreciate your help. Thank you. OK. Mr. Glenn? Thank you. Thank you, Glenn Bailey, speaking as an individual. Uh, I would recommend that the Homeowners Association file a claim against Caltrans, I mean, a legal claim. Um, I, I don't necessarily mean a lawsuit. I mean, prior to filing a lawsuit, you have to file a claim. Um, that may get their attention, maybe not. Maybe they'll just kind of write off 28,000. But, um, you know, there may be other costs too. Number two, I am really appalled that pine trees are being used in a high wind, high fire area. Uh, the city was told uh, with regards to Lime Kiln Canyon Park, I was involved back then when the former council member from like three times ago uh, said, put in oak trees, don't you know, be planting these high, um, high fire danger plants. So I would just suggest, uh, you know, like the um, Amigo and Rinaldi, um, you know, what, what didn't burn is, you know, in standing and dead, anywhere that that happens, you've got another fire danger. So um, I think Caltrans needs to reevaluate their plant palette. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And Jason, go ahead. I, I just want to make, you know, I, I totally agree with Becky. I think the next step for your homeowners association is to set up a meeting with the assembly member. You know, this is a state assembly member. This is a state issue. And, you know, we're happy to attend. You know, uh, three of us can attend, invite us. You know, we have relationships with them and they can bring in Caltrans they can get the money, you know, they hold the purse strings. We talked about this, Susan. So that's your next step. I hope that um, you, can, you can get that happen and, and we will uh, bring it up with them, but that would be my, um, my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Susan. I know this topic is going to come up on uh, agenda today, which today is, my, my is going to get tabled, but there's going to be multiple motions regarding this matter on the 22nd, which we have a special meeting coming up. Just give you a heads up. Okay. okay. Uh, any further questions? Otherwise, we can move on. No, nope. thank you again, Susan. Thank uh, you. For everything you're doing. And we will definitely stay in touch. And you're in touch with Jason, which is a great connection for Brush, especially. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Take care. All right, let's move on. Uh, next item is the motion to support the letter to uh, California State Governor. We're actually going to be tabling this, as I mentioned. Uh, till the 22nd. So both motions can be discussed at the same time next uh, next week. Let's move on to the next agenda item, which is um, Christine, it's yours. Yes, it's the motion to approve the October 13th uh, draft minutes. I'll second that. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. That's good. Hey, before we vote on that, I got a couple of concerns. There's some like inconsistencies with some of the transcription of it, if you will. Uh, there were some comments of mine were taken out of context, and there's some other comments that someone else mentioned to me. Can we? You're, you're cutting off. We can't hear you, David. Oh, boy. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Go ahead. There's some inconsistencies with what I was saying. What I said was that it taken out of context in the minutes. And there's some other comments another uh, person brought to my attention that was different from the actual content of the video. Can we can we postpone that so we review that? Uh, board, are you fine with that? Yeah, I think it's important that people read the minutes and the fact that he's reading them. I think that we we have to give them a benefit of the doubt. I read them like half an hour before and it looked fine to, to me, but I'm not paying attention to Lasher's comments, so. Exactly. If you what want. if I if I could ask Gabriel what um what are isn't this the time when we make the changes or make suggestions if we've already read it? That is correct, but I think David is making a motion to uh, table he's, it. So the he's point. dealing with the family issue right now, so I, I would respect. I, I yeah, I'm at the I'm at the, if you just obvious I'm at Northridge Emergency Room right now. Yeah, yeah. just send a um. Can I make a comment? Go ahead. I think for like transparency purposes, it's best if like we all know what the changes are, just so you know, like we should we need to be transparent about sure. Changes I can to email it to Gabriel. Yeah, just so like at, at some point the changes are presented. That's all I asked. So I, Jason, what I do is once he sends me the changes at the at the twenty second, I'll review the changes, let everybody know the changes that were made on the original. Yeah, like if you put them in red or you do like a strikeout or something, if you show the changes, then that then we all see, you know, what's being changed. That'd be great. Most appreciated. Thank you, David. Is everybody yeah. okay with that, Horn? Yes. Seems, okay. Let's table that motion as well. Thank you. Excuse me. This is the note taker. The motion was made and seconded it. That motion doesn't need to be rescinded. Oh, the, you don't have to second a tabling. Yeah, well, he's withdrawing. You're going to withdraw the motion, right, Gabriel? The motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's take a five minute, let, it says 10 minute break. Let's take a five minute quick break so we can start with the retreat. Is everybody good with that? Thank you. Five minute break. So let's come back at 735.
All right, board, if you guys can hear me, if you can start coming back, that will be great. All right, seems like we have a quorum. We have six of us here. And Brandy and Christine, are you guys there right now? Yep. Perfect, Christine? Yes. Perfect. Let's move on. Uh, welcome to the retreat now, officially. Uh, we're going to start off with item number 14, which is new board member introductions. As you know, last few months, we've had multiple new board members. If each of you can speak about your passions and goals, what you would like to see change in the, in the board, and what would, like, what, we, what would you like to do on the board? We could start from there until we open up to the stakeholders with questions and answers, and then we can go through uh, the committees after that and their passions and ideas, et cetera. Um, any of the new board members who, want, who wants to start? Don't be shy. <laughs> I can start. Hilda, go ahead. If, it could be one minute. Just say your passions and goals and what you want changed or what you want to see on the, on the PRNC. Well, um, my name is Hilda Sarkissian, for those of you that don't know me. So um, I got involved because I want to make a better change in, in our community, like the cleanup, the fire, whatever you're talking about, I totally agree. I want to, I want to get that, make that change. Uh, but there's few things that it's out of our control and um, um, let's not get to that, but uh, I'm sure most of you know what I'm going to be talking about, but uh, I want, I do want to focus on the education. I do want to get the schools. Um, I want to see what their needs are, what we can do to help them. Um, I want to help the students or whatever the, the I, I mean, I'm new to this, but I will, I'm willing to help and willing to learn and willing to make that change. And um, I'm committed to it. So um, that's about it. Is there anything else you want to hear from me? <laughs> Thank you, Hilda. Okay. Who wants to go next? Voss, you want to go next? Can't hear you, sorry. Okay. So is it regarding the committee or? No, uh, just in general, uh, what are your passions and goals? What you want to see done in Porter Ranch? Committee is coming up after. Okay. So my passion is to take the Porter Ranch to the number one in the neighborhood council among the city. And uh, I want it to be recognized with the perfection and to promote the interest at the city level. And uh, like uh, I keep visiting the I mean, on the virtually, I'm attending the meetings, webinar, seminars, keeping myself updated with the information, and I will share it with the PRNC whenever and as they become available. Thank you, Vas. Thank you. Jennifer? Floor is yours. Hi. Hello. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, I initially ran because I love our neighborhood, number one. Um, I've grown up here and um, I thought that this would be a good opportunity to just familiarize myself with, you know, 
everything, every policy process, um, all the things that our neighborhood needs um, to stay, you know, the uh, beautiful neighborhood that I've grown to love and adore growing up. Um, I do have uh, some passions that I'm, I gear more towards like the elderly committee, which I'm in charge of. And um, I've gotten into uh, public safety recently and the beautification committee, outreach, budget and finance and election committee. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm definitely excited because uh, it's very informative to know a little about every committee. And so, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to more participation in the future. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Christine? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, perfect. So I as well have lived in the Valley my entire life. Um, I'm a homeowner and business owner in the community as well as a local realtor. Uh, my family and I have been members of the community for years being in the restaurant industry. And my husband and I chose Porter Ranch as the community to raise our now one-year-old son. And I joined the board uh, to engage with the community and get to know people better and do my part in keeping it safe and just amazing as it's always been. Um, I have a passion for events and bringing people together. And that's why, you know, I'm honored to be the chair of the outreach committee, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but I would love to bring parents and children together, um, you know, monthly. And I definitely want to, you know, I don't know the scope of everything fully yet being new, but um, I want to keep the community safe and clean. And I hope that we could work together in that. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Brandy, I know you're not new, but you're newly, you just got on the board again. You want to say something real quick? Sure. Um, my, my main concerns, as I said, when I was running, um, are homelessness and Aliso. And I'm like a dog with a bone about both of those. So, <laughs> um, but I'm here to support everybody else. And I'm, I'm, I've done a lot with outreach and with sustainability and I've done stuff for, all the different groups that I could possibly do. So if you ever need help and are allowed by the Brown Act, always feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to help. And usually I'm at every event when I can. So there you go. Thank you, Brandy. All right, let's move on to the next item, which is open question answers uh, with stakeholders. Stakeholders, the floor is yours. Just raise your hand. And if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to ask, uh, the floor is yours. Asad? Floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. No, just I have a pressing question. Somehow along the line, COVID-19 disappeared from your radar and from discussions or any updates on the CDC where we're going with vaccination and all that. And I personally think it should be in every single agenda until we get over this. And beside that, thank you for what you're doing uh, all and appreciate it. Thank you. Th thank you, Asad. Any other questions from the stakeholders? Nope. Okay. Let's move on. I know a lot of people are going to be watching this on YouTube. I did get a lot of phone calls saying, when will the vid video be up and et cetera. So I'm looking forward to a lot of views on the videos. Uh, let's open up the next item, which is committee discussion. Discussion of committee focus over the next one year. Let's start with uh, Jason. Floor is yours with beautification. We can't hear you. Okay. Um, I thought we were doing, uh, can we do the CIS stuff first? You want to do the CIS first? We yeah, that's that. A, because it says how a board operates, but I'd like to do the CIS stuff first. Okay, let's bring number item number 17 forward then. And no, we're on, um, it's 16B. Oh, how to research case files. Oh, you had it, you put it somewhere else? Yeah, I, I moved it. 
It's on item number seven separately. Yeah, let me not just talk report. about the CIS stuff. Go I think for it. this is really important. Um, so I wanted to just for all the new people and even, you know, we, we all can learn, but I just wanted to start out with, um, you know, one of the important functions of the neighborhood council is our ability to file a CIS. And, um, you know, I want to thank Voss for making the point of our advocacy within the city. And that's really what, where we have our power and how we can uh, influence the decisions that our city makes. And so I wanted to first um, show you how to find out about things. So see how it says uh, Google here, City Clerk Connect. So you go to City Clerk Connect, and this is how you can find the council file management system. You can also file all the, find all the city contracts, ordinances, a lot of stuff here, council calendar. But I just wanna um, show you. So uh, if anybody wants to give me a topic to pull up here, um, but let's say I just pull up Porter Ranch, okay? We're on the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. Okay, Becky, maybe you have a topic, but just so I just put in a search here, Porter Ranch, and you can see all the different things that come up here. You have a lease, so you have the art fund, you have the uh, development agreement, um, a lot of different things. So I just want to show you how, how this would work. So you basically, you go into the council file and you can, you can follow the, actually, let me go back. Go ahead, Becky. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, it, it's just really a, a quick statement. The new members, maybe you guys don't know what a CIS is. Oh, okay. Sure. So if you could explain that to them, I yeah, think yeah, that yeah. might help them. Um, okay. So it, can you see this screen here, this community impact statement screen? So basically what, a, what it is, is um, I was kind of getting to it with these council files. So basically um, when something comes up in the city, it it's, comes up in the form of a council file, but we as a neighborhood council can file an impact statement. And that basically means that we're taking a position or we're not taking a position or we're making a statement. So you can, you can file it as a, see how it says here, for, for if amended, against. So for example, let's say we have something that's coming up to our, uh, for example, we had a, um, a thing with the park. They were wanting to name the park. Um, there was a motion regarding uh, naming the park, uh, Bloom Park. And we did, so let's say we looked that up. We filed a community impact statement on that. So see, it's 15-0104-S7. So this motion came up in 2019. And see where it says community impact submitted by Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. So this is what an actual community impact statement looks like. It'll come up here. So this is filed here. And it, and it shows the votes. So we had nine yays, zero nays, and this is the summary. So this is what we bring to the board, the summary, and the board reviews the summary and votes on it. And once that's voted, and then here's the letter. So this letter went to Rex and Parks regarding the 50 acre park. So this is an example of, and then it's signed by um, president and land use chair. So this is what, what uh, CIS is, and it allows you five minutes when this comes to the council, which this one never did because um, it just did it. But when it comes to the council, it allows five minutes for uh, one of the representatives from the board to speak on this item in front of the council or in front of the committee. So this might've gone to the Rex and the parks uh, committee See how it says here, uh, motion February 1st, refer to health education. So it would have gone to this committee, okay? And then the impact statement was filed. And then, um, then here, like on January, 2021, um, I believe this file just ended up expiring. So this is how an impact statement works. So if you're interested in certain things, like does anybody have a, a topic that they're interested in? Um, Otherwise, I'll just, uh, if somebody throws something out there, I'll look it up just to give an example. 
like uh, let's say homelessness. Okay, and then look at the dates on the right side. So you wanna choose stuff that's active, right? So start with the stuff that's most active. So here you have something that's, um, here's unaccompanied homeless immigrant minors. So you basically comb through these files and you can see what's going on. Or if you have something like, here's something September 29th, this is the uh, data collection point in time. So whatever issue issue you're interested in, you know, I, I, I look up things on like trees, for example, um, but there's different council files. And as you hear things going on in the city, you can look up on there. And then if there's something that you wanna to bring to the board, you can make a motion to file a CIS and you write the text of it, which goes, see this summary space? That's gonna be where you put the text of the CIS, okay? And then you can attach the letter. See other attachments here? You can attach a letter. So when you write a CIS, you need to know what you want to do, what you want to do with the council file. But you can also file CISs. I want to show you guys this. See all these different commissions, planning commissions, so like North Valley, airport commissions, animal services, building and safety. So these different boards like fire and police commission, let's say you want to file a CIS with the fire and police commission. You can do it right here. The zoo, water and power, ethics commission. Usually you're doing city council and committees right here. That would be the, the usual, but um, you can do a uh, convention center. Let's see. You can also do like um, the board of neighborhood commissioners is on here, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, see, there it is. Board of neighborhood commissioners, like Gibson was saying, if we want to weigh in on the, the, the training and things like that. So this is how the system works. We can have up to five people who can file these. I think right now I might be one of the few that are approved. I don't know if anybody else is approved, but we can also approve um, additional board members to be able to file these. But it's just kind of like a secretarial type of you know, job where you're putting it in, entering the vote count and the date it was. So the key here is you're either gonna be for, for the council file, for if amended, which means that you like it, but you wanna add some suggestions, you're against it, you're against it unless they change it or you're neutral. So maybe you just have some, some comments or feedback that you wanna give, but you don't really have a, a position per se. Um, so that's, that's really how we can weigh in on things that are going on in the city. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in the city. So, you know, when you, when you follow, but it's not just the city, you know, it's all those other commissions and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, if there's any questions or, um, oh yeah, Glenn, Glenn is a big fan of CIS. I should have had Glenn do the presentation, but <laughs> Glenn, can you talk? Go ahead, buddy. Hey, Jason, you did great. Thank so you. I Thank could you not have friend. done any better. <laughs> um, but the one thing I just wanted to add just for folks to think about is uh, several times over the years, as a result of filing a community impact statement on, on an issue that uh, ended up getting picked up by the news media, is um, we, the neighbor council, me or others with neighbor council, were contacted only because the community impact statement had been filed, right? So they're doing a story, they check out the council file, they see which neighbor councils have filed a community impact statement and the contact information is there and they, you know, they're working on a story, they've got a deadline. And so they'll probably reach out to a number of councils, get the point of view or depending if it's a local thing. So it's another advantage just to keep, keep in mind that um, just don't think it goes into a, into a something that nobody reads. Maybe that's sometimes the case, but just know that um, it's happened a number of times and it's another benefit that, it's unexpected. You never know when it might happen. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good point. And um, I don't know if you guys saw what I just did, but one of the things I like to do is just go into here and you select the mover. So you can select our councilman and you can see hit the search bar and then you can see what motions that he's putting forth. So here you can see like, see how the date, these are all the recent things. So like in November, 
he he has the street racing uh, motion. He's got some restriction, uh, some stuff on uh, Sierra Canyon. You can just kind of comb through these things. Um, and this is kind of where some of the, like here's oversized parking restrictions here. You can also see where some of the discretionary funds are going. Like here's Sunshine Canyon going to Granada Hills North for trees. I'm familiar with that. So I, I go through these things and then you can kind of see what, what's going on in terms of um, our councilman. Like here's something on Aliso Canyon right here. Um, here's like graffiti and weed abatement funding. So if you wanna really get an understanding of how the city works, this is how you do it. So like here, I'll go on the graffiti abatement. And then you can see what the motion and the motion will tell you exactly where the funding is coming from. It'll tell you what the motion is for. See here, you can see that they're transferring 120 from fund number 1056 to the public works fund, account number, et cetera, et cetera. So you see exactly you know, how, how things are, are working within the city, who's handling it, West Valley Alliance. If you wanna go in and see their contract with the city, you can do that too. And you just go back here. You know, anytime you do work, like when we hired a vendor, we had to get a contract. So you could just go in here and, and do like um, West Valley. And then you can pull up and you can see if you're curious what, these are all the people who have contracts with, with the city. So if you want to see, um, you know, what, here's the friends of the library, you can see exactly, you know, what's going on. So it's all, it's all out there and it's all transparent. It's just um, a matter of, you know, knowing how to look for it. If you want to see an ordinance, like the new ordinance that they passed uh, with respect to the homelessness, there's a new ordinance on that. You can look it up right here and get the, the full text of the ordinance. And you don't need the number. You can search by the, um, by the uh, keyword. You'll have to comb through it. But if you look at the dates, so you just go off of the dates. So this, this one in October is probably the most recent one. So this is, I believe, the new ordinance that they passed here. So anyways, I just want to give you guys some tools here. Um, you know, this, oh, this is regarding safe parking. You know, so if you, it is with respect to your committees and you want to see what's going on, this is how you find out, you know, what's going on and uh, try and do a CIS before it comes to the, the final council, because that's how you're really going to make a difference. Once it gets to the full city council, it, it's kind of late, late in the game. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, you want to file the CIS when the things are new. You know, like on the street racing thing or, um, you know, before it gets passed is really when you're going to have the most impact. Jason, you want probably to... over time. <laughs> okay. Jason, you want to mention the procedure? It goes from committee to the board and then assigned to one person to upload the CIS, etc. You mean like in terms of our process or the Correct. city council process? Our process for um, filing. Well, you know, you can bring it to your committee and work on the CIS on that level. You can hold a committee meeting, but a lot of times these things are like really time sensitive because, you know, they do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And by the time we find out about it, you know, the meeting might, it might be going to committee like next week. So you may have to just bring it directly to the board, but if it's something that's like really dragging on and it's been like, Sometimes things have been sitting in committee for six months or nine months and you want to, you know, try and bring attention to it. So maybe you have time to bring it to committee, but basically you would, you would want to write the text of the CIS, like, like I'm showing here, this brief summary up to 2000 characters. And then you want to maybe do a letter addressed to, you know, the city council or the committee, let's say it's a budget and finance committee. So you may make the letter out to them or you know, maybe it's the area planning commission is, is voting on something, uh, um, a development here in Porter Ranch or, um, so you make the letter out to them. So let's say the fire commission, we are talking a lot about fires. Maybe we wanna, you draft a letter, you're gonna make it out to the fire commission and let them know that, you know, Caltrans needs to be regulated. You know, they shouldn't be getting away with this, for example, you know, not maintaining, like the homeowners have to. And then you would put, you know, the 
it would be like maybe you'd have no position on that. You know, you're just saying because there's not an actual council file. You know, usually you're going to have a council file, which you're going to put in right here. See the um, council file number right here. So you're going to need to get that. But you don't need that. That's optional. It says if known or ap applicable. Um, you know, you may not know when the thing's going to come up and you may not have a council file yet. Um, <clears throat> But that doesn't mean you can't still file the, file something because these are if applicable. So you can actually file, write a letter, vote on it, approve it, and send it to one of these agencies, even though there's not a council file because it says if known or applicable. Does that sound, uh, sound like I covered everything? And then... Um... Does any board member, any board members are interested on uh, writing CISS, contact me so I can put it on agenda for the 22nd so we can get a vote on who wants to be uh, authors of CISS. And so, so whoever wants to be able to, I know Jason, you're one right now. Any, anyone, can, anyone can bring a CIS to the board. It's just like the, this, this is access to the system. So the person that actually puts it in the system and I think Becky, didn't we approve you, Becky? I don't know if you have a password. You just need to get a password because I think we might have approved you a long time ago, back when like Susan was on the board. I was a, I was approved as well by. You just need to get a password then, because if you're already approved, then you have to just email. Um, there's a person. Well, well, Gibson wants you to go through him with everything. So email Gibson, and. Um, yeah, I forgot the guy's name, but he'll give you like my login is PRNC one. So you'll probably be like PRNC two or PRNC three. Okay. So you can have up to five people can file these things. But um, but Glenn has you know, a question. I would let me just say one thing. I would encourage board members to go in here and you know follow what's going on with the city. And if you hear something's coming up, like let's say the street racing thing, go in there and look at it. And, and try and understand where it is in the process, read all of the documents on the file, read the motion, read the, the comments from the public, and then you can kind of get an idea of what, you know, the CIA, what, what the motion is for, you know, what the motion is actually saying. Go ahead, Glenn. Uh, I don't want to take Gibson's. Uh, see. I think he's on another meeting though. Okay, so just, um... For the appointing of up to five persons authorized to file community impact statements, right. uh, there is a form that has to be filled out and you have to include the board vote count and the date of the motion. So if this was all done since the new board was seated, as far yeah, as appointing we need to vote, probably, yeah. you probably want to yeah, re-agendize it for your next meeting and at least add on Becky, add on Gabriel, and then if you have you know another one or two people, um, so you have a current current form, current date, current board vote count. Um, the, the name of the person is Lorenzo. Resinia. Yeah, that's right. Um, certainly cop, copying Gibson uh, is always a good idea, so he's aware of it. Um, and then sometimes there's an immediate response and sometimes not. So you, uh, that's how Gibson could be helpful in reminding, um, you know, to kind of move that along. But it just gives you, as you said, in uh, access to the portal. It's only taking the action taken by the board that it was voted on, get it uploaded. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Jason, for the presentation. All right. Uh, any other questions or should we move forward? Yes, okay. I'm just happy to help anybody. You know, if you have some things you want it or you hear going on, just let me know and I'll help you research it. I'm, I'm good at like researching stuff. So if anybody wants yes, help. You are. I'll second that one. <laughs> You're good at everything, Jason. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. <laughs> Seriously. Now that you're already speaking, uh, I'm gonna give you the floor again uh, to give updates regarding the beautification committee. Sure. Um, it, it's kind of big, um, the same kind of thing. Um, you know, Jennifer has uh, agreed to be my partner in crime with beautification. And I, um, you know, welcome anyone else who wants to reach out to me um, on, on that committee. But basically, like, I'm continuing to work, we're continuing to work on the park, you know, the Aliso Canyon Park, I mean, um, Lime Kiln Canyon Park, and actually, um, 
there, a bid went out for some work in the northern section where that kind of access road is so the fire department can get in there. And actually the councilman is um, gonna be funding that because he is gonna part, he wants to partner with us. So um, I'm in the process of getting bids for additional work now that we can do as well and vote on here so that we can kind of, you know, match match what they're doing. I mean, the idea is like, let's, let's work together, you know, and um, they decided to just get the work done because we're in fire season. And, um, you know, we approved 7,200 last year, but we didn't use it because, um, you know, we couldn't get the, the permit and it didn't work out. But um, anyways, I'm trying to get um, that whole park, like really all the brush knocked out. So it's safe, you know, and then um, also looking at doing so along Tampa because the fire got pretty bad on the east side of Tampa, on the hillside at Wilbur Tampa Park. Um, so just really trying to focus on that. Um, and then I, I, I was, you know, planting trees is going to be very difficult because the urban forestry does not have the staff to water the trees. And so unless um, people are going to volunteer or we're going to, you know, buy the equipment or, I mean, somebody's got to water the trees and that's really the holdup right now. So I think right now, just kind of focusing on, um, you know, Jill, Jill Mather is doing a lot of cleanups and she's doing the freeways, but, you know, certainly we, we, we should consider the 118 freeway. I mean, you know, we have these, these poor stakeholders of, of ours who have to live next to this brush and, um, you know, I want to help these people as much as we can. And I know you, you guys do as well. And, um, you know, what we really need to push um, with these elected officials, we need to push with Caltrans. We're going to talk about it at the next meeting, but we got to come in with the big guns because the money is there. Okay. They have the money. Wow. It's not an issue of money. You know, Becky's point is right. You know, we have a huge tax base here. Caltrans has money. The state is not broke. So, you know, we have to push to get the work done. We don't necessarily have to pay for it, but at the end of the day, you know, maybe we do. We just need to get it done. I don't care how we get it done. I just think that, you know, so that's kind of the, the beautification for me is like more pretty much focused. It does overlap safety in some respects, but it, it's definitely a beautification kind of you know, let's get everything cleaned up. If we can get the brush cleared, the trees trimmed up, that's the, really the, the focus right now. You know, um, the stump project was, was wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad we all supported it and we got that done. Um, but, you know, cleanups are a little bit tough and really I'm leaning on Jill Mather. She's doing a, a great job with cleanups. So, you know, all we have to do is bring her in and we get the troops in and um, we get it done. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the focus. I'm trying to kind of narrow in on, uh, you know, brush clearance pretty much. Becky, you got a little- uh, Jason, I had to unmute myself. I just wanted to say that uh, the Public Safety Committee and the Beautification Committee, they sort of overlap in a lot of areas. And uh, I think that we can work really well together. And I know that one of the things I'm planning for the public safety committee is to have open meetings so that the whole board can attend it, not just our three members, because this is more than uh, the beautification and the public safety with the trees and everything. And it, that's like of the utmost importance here right now. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the plan is to just have this discussion at the board level, you know, because um, it's really, we only have, we don't have much of a committee yet, <laughs> but I think it's just more productive for us all to be in on the discussion. Um, you know, we're all on the same page. It's not like we have to hash out all these details, you know, we just have to come up with the estimate, take the vote, you know, figure out the permits, the logistics, but, um, you know, let's, let's invite the assembly member, you know, to the next Good meeting. Idea. And let's let's invite Henry Stern's office because he's a state senator, and um, you know I'll, I'll reach out to Eric Moody see if he has a contact at Caltrans. But you know 
Caltrans, I think the best way to get them to come is through the assembly office. You know, Caltrans isn't going to come. Right, they, they won't come. But if the assembly member says, you know, we need you, or maybe they have a, a liaison, you know, I think that's the best thing is, you know, they need to hold Caltrans accountable because, um, you know, it, one thing I didn't mention, I, I was on a meeting with the fire department and they told me that Caltrans, the state of California is exempt, exempt from all the local fire ordinances. So I just want to let you guys know that I was shocked to hear that. So they don't have to clear the brush. They don't have to do, you know, the bottom third of the trees. They don't have to keep the, you know, the grass down to three inches like we all have to do in our homes. They're exempt. So I was shocked to hear that from the, from the, I was on one of the budget advocate meetings with the, um, the leadership from the fire department. And they told me that uh, I think it's the federal and the state government are exempt, but we can't stand for that. You know, we have to, we have to say, you know, you may not, you may be exempt, but that doesn't mean that you, you can just drop the ball. And, and, and uh, I think the thing about making the claim is, is important. You know, that there needs to be some accountability. You know, Agreed. that's how I feel. Thank you, Jason. Any questions for Jason? Any comments for Jason? Good job. Thank you, Jason, on updates. And then I'm pretty confident you'll be bringing quite a few motions this year for beautification and looking forward to them. Uh, let's move on to outreach committee. Christine? Yes, on behalf of the outreach committee, I want to introduce myself. Also, my co-chair, Be Becky Levesque. Um, Jennifer, who is also helping us on the committee, has been very helpful as well. And Hilda has stepped up uh, just tremendously, always volunteering. So thank you to this group of women. And, um, you know, we encourage anybody else in the community to join. Um, so right now I want to bring Becky on to talk about the YMCA Thanksgiving drive. Hi. Okay. Um, it was very successful. I don't know if, if any of you saw pictures. Um, I, I have to say, Christine, I, I'm just so impressed at the job that you're doing with our website, with, with getting the information out, with, uh, notifications for everyone. Um, the YMCA served uh, 3,000 meals to people who have no food for Thanksgiving. That's 12,000 people. Um, they, um, it, it was just amazing uh, that our neighborhood council got to play a role in all of that. It, it's such a great feeling. It was a great, it's been a great success. Uh, they had hundreds of volunteers, many of the schools that participated in putting the baskets together. It was a mammoth job. And um, I just am very happy to be a part of a neighborhood council that supported such a, a worthy cause and is feeding people who otherwise wouldn't be able to celebrate Thanksgiving. And that's our gift to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. So outreach has been a bit challenging with COVID and current COVID restrictions, as you guys know, um, as Gabriel touched on earlier, um, you know, the Granada Hills Street Fair was just one of those examples. Um, you know, we're following and monitor monitoring all of the COVID rules and regulations by the city and done to just make sure we're on top of it all. Um, so currently I am doing my outreach, like Becky said, on social media, like a lot of people are these days. Um, Wendy has been a great help too with the website and of course, Gabriel. Um, and this was actually not something that was done consistently prior uh, to, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, there's a lot of board members as well as community members who are still uncomfortable with the in-person events. So my hope is that by January 1st, there's gonna be a little bit more leverage with the in-person events and people's comfort levels. Uh, so once that happens, I hope to have events um, like a movie night in the park, as well as the Earth Day event, which I know that the board has done uh, so well in the past. And for the holiday season, I wanna do giveaways, possibly on social media to get the community involved and engaged. Um, I also wanna highlight some of the community activities from just 
you know, just members in the community. So I encourage them to email secretary at prnc.org with any photos so we can put it on our website and our social media pages. Um, you can follow us on Instagram. So our name on there is Porter Ranch underscore NC. And you can use the hashtag uh, PRNC to get our attention. And you can always tag us as well. Um, our name on Facebook is Porter Ranch NC as well. So, um, you know, I would love to get any community feedback on events that you would like to see um, or just anything that you want us to be more active in. Yeah, so can I add to that? Can I add something? Go ahead. Yeah, um, about uh, the, the why, yesterday I was there. Um, I was a little early, 9.30, and I stayed until one o'clock. And I'm telling you, it was amazing. It was just, when I walked into that gym, I got emotional. And just seeing that our community is putting things together to feed, to feed the people that are in need. And there's many, many of them out there. And I was just, I just wanted to know where to start. I just wanted to know right away. And there were a lot of volunteers. It was very well organized. Um, I was, and I would do it again. I would, I would help out because I sort of do that to, for my daughter's foundation, but this is totally different. This is way beyond over 3000, uh, I mean, families. And then when, when the schools were coming in and we were putting those bags in their trunk, they were like the appreciation, the, the way their people were saying like happy Thanksgiving. And it was just so totally different. It was really emotional. And I did take a few pictures. I did post one on YouTube and it's on my uh, Facebook page, but uh, I don't mind sharing it. And uh, just, we'll talk about it, Christine, and then we'll put it out there because it was, it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hilda. And for your volunteering, of course. Um, yes. And, you know, this was a very successful event. It was featured on KTLA. Um, and we have amazing pictures as well that we're going to put up as well as, you know, the community pictures like Hilda's. So please send in whatever you guys have so we could feature all of this. Okay. Um, you know, we want to keep the community engaged, informed and updated and just keep that momentum going. And, and also to go back to the street fair, um, I was willing to volunteer. I mean, I was uh, ready, um, like most of you know, but let's do this to get next year. Let's just be there as a group because Absolutely. if we're not bonded together, us right here, uh, nothing's going to happen. We have to start, our roots is here and then we can be, we have to get along and this is for a good cause. We got to show that, we're here. We're 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 part of our community, and if they have any questions, anything that they need, um, you know, they can contact us. This is what that's where it starts. Us. So, um, like we're this is another family. So I know I have a few families, but this is another family that we have to um, help out. Like yesterday, after I finished, I went to the group. I don't even know these volunteers. I went up to them. I, I thank them for being here. And if they had any questions or uh, concerns to reach out to us, I went back to David and I said, thank you. And that's what it's all about. It's uh, bonding together and, and um, um, you know, supporting each other. So, yeah, I want to touch on what Hilda just said. So I completely agree with her. Um, so outside of the COVID, um, you know, restrictions and kind of fears of, you know, people being uncomfortable, us as a board, we really do need that participation. Um, you know, we're on the board, not for, you know, ourselves or, you know, to have best friends. It's for the betterment of our community. And when we have an event, um, we really need these members to step up just for the community. I mean, that's what we were kind of voted in for. So I'm really hoping for that engagement moving forward. So thank you guys so much. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to contact me or let me know. Of course. Thank you, Christine. Anybody have any questions or comments <laughs> for her? Can I chime in? <laughs> Go for it, Jason. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so happy, Hilda, that you got all that energy you know, from, from going. And, um, you know, I always share things with the board, you know, that I feel will, um, sometimes it might be a, you know, a, a webinar, or sometimes it might be an ordinance from the city or, 
you know, but when I share things with the board, it's because I feel like it, it will help you. And, um, you know, we have a lot of experience on this board. So I encourage you, especially like Hilda, you're doing education and, you know, I'm very entrenched in the Castle Bay school, you know, and, and Gabriel and I, we both chair the governance, which is, um, you know, we, we allocate funding for the school and things like that. So, you know, we want to introduce you to people. We want to, um, you know, Becky knows a lot of people. I mean, we just want to, we want to like, um, kind of continue to build on this energy because that's, what's going to motivate you to participate. Like, of course. Think, you know, that's, that's, what's wonderful. I just want to say one thing to, um, Christine regarding events, um, you know, go ahead and put a motion in for an event and submit the event approval form because, you know, I got an event approved during COVID for the cleanup and all they asked is that you, you do have to follow the COVID protocols. Um, so, you know, don't be dissuaded from doing events. I know it, it seems like, you know, there, we can't do anything, but actually if you follow the pro COVID protocols, you have to submit that event approval form 30 days ahead of time, but give yourself, you know, some time, plan out in advance, get it approved by the board, submit the form, and they'll come back and they'll tell you, well, how are you going to follow the COVID protocols? And then you're going to go in and you're going to pull the stuff from the county and you're going to say, okay, we're going to, you know, wear our mask, blah, blah, blah. So, I, you know, I just want to encourage you to, you know, not be dissuaded to do events that we can, we can do events in a safe manner. And, um, you know, we need to, we need to get, get back to our normal thing, you know, and, yep. um, I want to just commend you. The website is really coming together, um, very well. And I think that, you know, we're all really starting to, and I'm so glad that you have all the support of, um, you know, the, the fantastic women on this board. So <laughs> I, know, I know we're in good hands with outreach. So good job, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason and Hilda. I appreciate You're welcome. it. welcome. Of course, anytime. Awesome. Any other questions for Christine? Oh, can I just say one thing? I forgot one thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea. Um, the and, and I wanted to, Christine mentioned there's a, we have a Canva account, C A N V A. And yes. Canva, you, you have that? Okay. One no, I things, don't have it, but I'm, I'm familiar with uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. We can, you can get a password. We have an account. You just email, I think, Canva at empowerla.com and or dot org, and you can get a password. But one of the things that they're doing at other councils is we're giving certificates to people in the community. For example, there's this couple that's always picking up trash along Tampa. I see them at every day practically. And I'd like to start, you know, as a, I, I'd like to start recognizing people in the community for the stuff they're doing because like Northridge West, every month at their meeting, they're giving, they're giving certificates to people, you know, like Jill who adopts the freeway. She got it last month, but I think it's so important because it, it just brings the members in, in our community to us. And it lets them know that, you know, we appreciate you and they become aware of, of us, you know, just through our recognition. So um, I'd like to make that suggestion that we implement like kind of a recognition award. I mean, maybe you want to recognize the YMCA, you know, the, the, the director there for, for, you know, all the good they did to the, to the community. So things like that every month, I think we can, we can kind of have this just regular thing. We vote to approve giving so-and-so a certificate. That's all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful suggestion. Okay. And um, I've noted it and I think we will move forward with something like that. So thank you. They have one in Canva. They have like a certificate thing all ready to go. Okay. I'll definitely check it out. Thank you. And then Brandy, you have something to ask or say? That she's awesome. Maybe yeah, she is. Awesome job. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I know you got this and I'm, I'm glad to see you're, you're running down the runway as fast as you can, which is good. So keep doing it. Thank you so much, Brandy. I appreciate it. And I, you know, I definitely look forward to meeting you and for us to all again, work together. Yes. I look forward to doing your many events. Awesome. Any other questions, comments for Christine? 
That's fine. Thank you again, Christine, for everything you're doing. You're prepping well for next year. And I look forward to 2022. It's going to be exciting. Thank you, Gabriel. Let's move on to traffic and safety. Uh, Becky? Hi, everybody. Um, well, I just, um, there's, where do you begin? There's, there's so much to talk about. I'd like to first um, open up with, um, we have sat in some meetings with Councilman Lee and with Senator Henry Stern on uh, the street racing. Um, just to let everybody get everybody up to speed for those who don't know, um, Valley Bureau, which is part of the Los Angeles Police Department, a section, um, has a special unit containing five officers that are assigned to these racing issues, these straight street racing issues. Um, right now, they lost one of the officers for they retired or whatever, and we're down to four officers. They're working with air support um to try and and put a stop to a lot of this um i've talked to a lot of the neighbors in the north uh, east section of Cessnon, and the pylons that were put up uh, seem to have really curtailed the street racing up there in that particular section and that was really great news to hear from from our stakeholders uh the senator has introduced some bills into the senate uh, to harden uh, the loss on the people who are doing the racing. One of the problems is, as many people already know, that these kids will use their parents' car. They, um, they get arrested. They're out the same day. The, they get the car back because it's mom's car. Well, they're, making, they're trying to change some laws. John Lee and uh, Henry Stern are trying to get some laws implemented to give the law enforcement end of it more avenues to curtail these, these horrific um, street racing problems that we're having with the street takeovers. Um, I was very happy to see, oh, about a week or so ago, I was driving on Wilbur and Rinaldi. I was coming um, west on Rinaldi to turn right on Wilbur and I didn't understand what all the traffic was at 11 o'clock in the morning. And as I turned the corner, I saw Bill Cotter there with volunteers from Devonshire Division in marked cars and with their vests on. And they stood on the corner and they were um, clocking the people who were coming through the intersection. And I think that that's a, I couldn't believe the effect that it had. And they were there for a couple of hours and uh, people you know, got the message that uh, you, you know, that's just one example. It was just a few hours and we need to do more of that to let people know, you know, to slow down on that hill, especially at that intersection, because as we know, for over the years, it's been a huge topic of conversation and we need to do something to amend it. Um, I have uh, worked with Christine in getting information out uh, on crime and the basic car meetings are really important for us to attend. Now, for those new people who are not familiar with the, the Devonshire Division of the Los Angeles Police Department, um, basic car meetings, we have two basic cars in the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council area. Uh, Danny Del Valle is the senior lead officer, and that's the name of the officer that oversees um, a part of Porter Ranch. And the other one is uh, senior lead officer John Parker. They're both just amazing at what they do. Um, Danny Del Valle hands, handles the part of Porter Ranch. They, they handle all of Porter Ranch, the two of them. We're really lucky because they, they split it up to two officers rather than just one. And But Danny Del Valle officially handles the part that is west of Tampa. And uh, John Parker handles the part that's east. They usually have a monthly meeting that the community is invited to, and I find them extremely helpful. I did talk to um, Senior Lead Officer John Parker. I texted him uh, this evening, and he sent me the most recent crime statistics, and I sent them to the board and also to Gabriel and to Christine if they would like to post the crime stats to see what kind of crimes we're having up here in Porter Ranch. Um, and let's see, uh, the Public Safety Committee, I sent you the crime stats and, and um, basically that, that was my report. We're hoping to have a public safety meeting on the fire that happened um, 
down the street um, that we have been talking about this evening. And hopefully we'll be able to have a Zoom meeting within the next few weeks to decide what course of action that we want to take. And Jason, I'd love for you to be involved in that um, because I think it, you have so much knowledge and uh, maybe we can have an open meeting and just, just try and, and come up with a game plan to help support um, the people who live here in Porter Ranch, it's like a time bomb that's ready to go off and we really have to take care of it. I have uh, the honor of working with Gabriel Conlian and um, also with uh, Jennifer Abraham. Uh, they are on the uh, Public Safety Committee with me and I look forward to us um, making sure that Porter Ranch is the safest community that um, anyone can ever grow up in. A little history, I, I got started. I've lived here for since 1983. My house was broken into. My, I'm a baseball family, kids in, in professional baseball, the whole thing. And they had the audacity to break into my house in the early, late 80s and steal my son's baseball card collection that was valued at $3,000. Um, I'm sure it was an inside job on some part, but that's what got me started on um, community policing. And I encourage everyone to participate, to go to your basic car meetings and um, see what's going on in your neighborhood because knowledge is power. And that's basically uh, my plan. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to give me a call. I was, uh, at one point I was, uh, I've been involved in a lot of the organizations, the police organizations in, in Devonshire and, and in the city of Los Angeles. And I was a specialist police reserve officer for a short period of time and my expertise was photography. <laughs> so I uh, photographed crimes that were in process, in progress. And I uh, look forward to working with all of you on, on this very important issue and would like to um, you know, make Porter Ranch as safe as possible. Thank you very much. Any yep. I have, I've made my way, uh, 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 my way home from the hospital. Um, a couple of things on COVID. I have been doing a presentation for, with COVID, associated with COVID for the board uh, at the request of uh, the previous safety committee. I can go back and do that, but that's with the new committee. I had been asked to do that. Um, on the car issue, uh, I don't know if people know this, but the mufflers, Jerry, the uh, governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, just vetoed a bill that restricted the muffler noise. I think it was done as a, a freedom of speech issue. The noise from the mufflers is a freedom of speech issue. So now the police cannot enforce the mufflers that are illegal and modified and loud. Um, I don't know where that came from or why, but it was, that was repealed or vetoed by Governor Newsom last week. So that's one less tool the cops have on that. And Becky's absolutely right. A lot of cars, it isn't so much they put them in their parents' name, it's they put them in the bank's name. So they're leased or bank owned they're not going to confiscate a car from a bank. The bank will take it back, um, but it isn't like where you own the car and they take it. So a lot of these street racers are leasing cars specifically. So if they do get impounded, they know that it's not on them. It's on the bank. The bank's not going to suffer. Um, but yeah, those three th issues related to safety, uh, um, pretty uh, critical and a couple timely with the recent appeal or again, this veto from Gavin Newsom. Thank you, David. That was new information. I never knew about the repeal of the mufflers, so that that's something new. I was, in, I was informed of that yesterday by a Burbank uh, police officer. They're gotcha. very upset. That's one less tool they have with respect to dealing with street racers and the illegally modified vehicles, and uh, they were it's a problem. Gotcha. Thank you. We'll have to Sorry. ask him about that. We'll have to ask uh, Henry Stern why he did that. I'm really curious the relation between freedom of speech versus muffler sounds, but it was the governor, not Henry Stern. It was the governor. Gavin Newsom vetoed it. We'll look into it. it looks That's like Hilda's next, and then Brandy. Correct. Yeah, my my question to Becky: um, How likely we can meet with the Devonshire Division just to like, um, you know, with protocols, of course, but just to set up a time and, you know, um, just communicate and meet them face to face and see who they are. They need to see who they, we are, what we're doing, what is our position to help out each other. Is that something that we could do? That's done on a monthly basis. And actually the meeting was this evening. 
um, at oh. the same as ours. And Christine, I've, I've been sending the information to Christine and she's been posting it on our website. So just keep your eyes open and okay. it'll have all the Zoom information. You can call Devonshire Division and ask for your senior lead officer. They will call you. And we talk to them all the time. They've had a few in-person meetings, but because of COVID, I think they've gone back to the Zoom meetings for, and tonight was the last meeting of the year. But I will keep you guys informed of when all the meetings are. Yeah. And um, you really should get to be on a first name basis. One of the things that I hope to do in, on this public safety committee is get back to neighborhood watch meetings. I, I set up the neighborhood watch for Porter Ranch. Um, just in the golf course area, we had a meeting um, because of my baseball cards, and we had over um, uh, 400 people show up. They walked in with torn screens. This was before we had a way, there was any way of tracking uh, crimes and any crimes in a neighborhood. The police department didn't know we were having these crimes because people don't report them. Reporting crimes is so very important. And um, they will meet with you. I, I'd like to have, we, used, we had meetings in, in people's homes where they invited their neighbors. We could do it in the backyard. And John Parker or Dan Del Valle will come out to your house and they will go over the crime stats for your particular area. Um, and it's, it's really important that we all stay in touch, that we all be vigilant, that you know who your neighbors are. Exactly. And if you see something, you know, report it. Yep. So I'll be happy to work with you, Hilda. Yeah, I would love that. Okay, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Jason? Oh, I got oh. my hand removed. Oh, oh, go ahead, Brady. Jump go on. Ahead. Uh, so Becky, you and I were, were working months ago on the mosquito thing, and there had been a discussion that that might be under this, the safety committee, which you're now in charge of. Do you want to do that in the safety committee? Um. Yeah, let, let, let's get together and talk about how we can make that happen. And okay. you know, Brandy, one of the things I'd really like to do that, that this our board hasn't really done much of in the past is to open up our committee meetings to the whole board. And there's a way to do that. So I it's agree. not just three people. I, I agree. I agree. Okay. Thanks. I look forward to working with you, Brandy. You too. And then Becky, regarding what you just said, uh, just check with Gibson to find out the logistics. Of Absolutely. Having... Yeah. Jason? I think um, what, what Hilda was suggesting regarding, um, you know, bringing in Devonshire Division, it would make sense to just have like a safety committee uh, joint board meeting and then invite Devonshire Division and, you know, give them 15, 20 minutes and then another, you know, 15, 20 minutes from the community and you know, you can tell them ahead of time, we want to talk about this or, and you can do the same thing with the fire department or whoever. But I think the point is, is like, we need to bring these people in. Um, and I just want to make a comment, like as far as what uh, David Lasher was saying regarding uh, Burbank police told him about something. So like, we just need to get more details. Like what is the actual, um, you know, we have to do the research, right? So like, that that particular thing that got vetoed so david if you do have more information can you just email that stuff that you want to email to the whole board so like if there's some information that you got that you know about with regard to the mufflers try and research it a little bit send it to the board so that it lands on you know everybody's desk and then you know maybe there's a letter that we can write or maybe there's a council file we can um, do a cis on but um, Becky, I wanted to mention, so this council file that John Lee did, 21-0975, uh, it passed, but basically it's saying that the city attorney is going to report back. So you have to stay on top of that and see, okay, well, what is going to be coming from that? So, you know, let's, let's figure out what the recommendation is from the city attorney. We can still do a CIS on that if there's some recommendations that we have. So, you know, really it's important to do the CIS on these things, to send the letters and, you know, have the discussion and make the recommendations because we're sitting here experiencing this every day, right? I mean, we, we know what's going on in our community, you know, more than anyone else. So we should be really, you know, writing the letters, filing the CISs. And that's, that's all I just wanted to make 
that comment, you know, let's let's stay on top of these um, council files because you got a councilman who's pushing this stuff through, but we need to back him up too. Like we need to we need to do our part and say, hey, you know, th this is what's going on. You know, these are the real world examples we're seeing, so that you know everybody knows. So that's all. Well, I think these are really great suggestions, and I think that uh, we could invite. This one of the senior lead officers to maybe one of our next meetings and, and the same thing we could invite Councilman Lee to speak at one of our meetings on that just that one issue. Um, I think that would be really valuable for the community and I'm all in favor of it. Thank you, um, David, you have another question. Yeah, let me circle back on that. Um, um, first off, I'm, I'm not so much a, an apology, but the whole. This evening's been a bit weird for me. I've been the last, I just parked in front of my house. I've been at uh, Northridge Hospital for six hours. So um, I didn't want to miss the meeting. And my wife had my son in the other car and back and forth. So um, we just got Is home. Is he okay? And that's Is kind of why okay? I'm in my car. Uh, broken elbow, some stitches oh. in his face. But yeah, he oh. could have been a lot worse. Oh. Um, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I don't, well, thanks very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. I don't usually drive around on my, uh, on a Zoom call or parked from my house on a Zoom call, um, but that's kind of an explanation. On uh, terms of the muffler law, like I just heard about that, I've definitely intended to research it. I'll provide more on that. Um, Becky kind of circled back and stole some of my thunder. I was going to reference that we've had great success with the senior leads coming out to neighborhood watch meetings. They're they're more than happy to do that, Hilda. So they'll they'll come out on a you give them a, a little, little bit of notice, but you know maybe a week or a few days at least. But they're happy to come out and. Um, and let me know about the COVID thing if you want those Thank that graph and informational slides. Again, I can I can uh, re restart that again. Just let me know. And uh, we have LUSD. But, yeah, I'll get more information on the on the muffler law. I'll get back to you. Thank you, David. What's that? I, isn't yes, LUSD going to be? Doesn't Gabriel? Doesn't LUSD want to come and talk about COVID? Or no? Uh, they haven't said anything yet, but they're they'll probably they'll probably be there. Tara will probably be there on twenty seconds. Scott usually starts to talk about it, talk about our updates. Any other questions or comments for uh, safety? Awesome. Thank you again, Becky. Thank you Looking all. Forward to 2022. Let, let's move on to the next one, uh, Homelessness Committee. Uh, Brandy, I know you just took over uh, the homelessness, and I used to be in the same committee. Uh, do you want to talk about it today? Yes. Um, can I share screen? Oh, yes. Go for it. All right. Uh, let's see if. Let me see if this is visible. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. So. Um, so let's talk about. Oh, sorry. So uh, this is this is everything I want to talk about for the coming year, basically. Um, so first of all, counting LA's homeless, the Housing and Urban Development HUD uh, Federal Department mandates an annual count of homeless individuals throughout Los Angeles. Uh, LA's count is run by the LA Homeless Services Authority at La Hasa at the end of January. How, uh, the count involves about 8,000 volunteers, so there's an opportunity for our community to get involved when it happens. But due to COVID-19, this did not happen in 2021. Um, HUD explicitly excused us, and that means that the data that we have is at least a year old. <clears throat> Some important things to note about the count's limitations. It's only what they call a snapshot of those exact three days in January they count. So if you have a family of four that is homeless in February and housed in December, they are never counted at all in this uh, population. Um, it only includes people who are visible and available. So if our hypothetical family of four is sleeping in a car that nobody knows about and they don't know where they are, they also won't be counted even if they're homeless during those three days. Um, if all four of them are sleeping in a tent, most likely they are all gonna be counted as a single person because tents are often counted from afar as one person per tent, no matter how many people actually use that tent. So we are basically 100% certain that the homeless count is far below the actual numbers is what this comes about to. So here's some LA totals. Uh, what we do know for a fact is the population that we are aware of that exited homelessness from 2019 to 2020 uh, was 75,000 plus people. 
about 22,000 of them were placed into housing through LA various services, and the other 52,000, what they say, self-resolved. So if somebody was homeless and sleeping in their car for six months and then got a job that allowed them to get an apartment and we had nothing to do with them, that's considered self-resolved. So these are the people we knew about who exited homelessness in that year. And you can see it's more than double the amount of people that we actually help help themselves. Um, so good for them. Even at, not, in, not in that population at all, the 2020 total of at that point in time, homeless people was over 66,000 for LA County. Um, the shelter capacity, and this is true as of July, I believe 2021, it's of the summer, is only about 24,000 people in total. So we can't even shelter half of the number of people uh, that are homeless. And this is kind of a demonstration because the number of minors that we have is much smaller than the LAUSD data of, of people. So a lot of people believe the LAUSD data for minors, which is last count was 17,000 plus students or about one homeless student per class in all of LAUSD. Okay, so very quick facts, 12%, this is what, this is of the homeless count. 12% are children and teens under 18, 17% have a physical disability, 22% report a long-term mental illness, and substance abuse went up significantly from around 15 to 18%, it suddenly rose in the last year to 24%. Uh, and 29% are victims of domestic violence. So we have a whole range of the people that qualify as being homeless or unhoused. Um, LA has the fewest number of housing units per adult of any major US city, period. So we are, we are way at the, we are at the, we are the bottom. Um, CD12, however, is only one of two council districts with less than 1,000 reported homeless. We specifically have 735 homeless that includes 114 family members. Um, just for CD3 is the lowest and CD9 is the highest at almost 5,000. So that gives you kind of the range of what we're dealing with locally. Okay, so what our committee has done in the past, uh, in the past few years, we dealt with supporting Clean Streets, Clean Starts, which is a program that allowed people, individuals who were homeless to get paid to do street cleaning work. Um, uh, did I lose you guys? Yeah. Okay, Zoom just gave me a weird message. Um, <clears throat> I was one of the founding members through this committee of, uh, we call it WAVNA, the West Valley Neighborhood Alliance of Homelessness. Um, so this is the main alliance for the West Valley of all various neighborhood councils, nonprofits, and, and advocates from different sides of the issue. Uh, we did a lot of outreach and support that included before COVID going out and actually bringing food to people, whether they were living in encampments or in cars or, or on the street, um, and trying to get them support to help them get into uh, LA services. It's on average, it takes about what they say 17 points of contact. You have to talk to somebody or someone has to talk to someone 17 times before they trust you enough to listen to the services that you try to help them with, because so many of them have run the gamut of services over and over and over again and been burned so many times. They've lost money, they've lost possessions. And so they just, there's a lack of trust all the way around. Um, so the more that we can do advocacy and outreach, the more that we help with the, the situation in general. And I helped run a, a job fair that we worked through WAPNA to do this. Um, so that's what we've done before. What I would like to do next, uh, I really would like to do a homelessness town hall and to hold town hall talking about this issue because we know with COVID it has exploded. There are all new issues. It's becoming such a big issue that, that there's very likely going to be a ballot issue. So we may even need to talk about that. Um, it's just it's just something that should be talked about. And I think we got so many emails before about this issue that we've had very motivated community members who are wanting to know what the city and county are doing for them. And people on different sides need to be able to come together and talk about what the issues are. Um, we need to do more coordination with local services, including local shelters, more support for the homeless families and students that are in our community. Um, especially, you know, knowing that we have 114 homeless family members, we need to be stepping up in that particular area because as I've, all people are special, but I care more for the children than anything else. And that's my personal bias. Um, advocate for improved government services, which I've talked about a million times, how lackluster they are and we need to do better. 
uh, and also advocate for sanitation improvements. Um, for anybody who has been following this issue, <laughs> a few years ago, they found the, the United Nations sent out people that found that for 1800 people just in Skid Row alone, there was only nine toilets, which is uh, <laughs> the UN's refugee camp requirement would have required a minimum of 90 for that many people. So we are well below the necessary number of toilets. And they, for COVID reasons, went out and got a whole bunch of porta potties for various homeless communities. And even that was only about 180. And they've had to replace 170 of them and now they're taking them away. So this is leading to people can't get access to a bathroom. They're gonna go wherever they can go. And that's probably not gonna be a place that we like and it's probably gonna smell really bad. So uh, we need to do better for everybody's sake when it comes to sanitation and sanitation act, uh, service access. Uh, so these are the things I would like to focus on, especially with the town hall, I will come to the rest of the board with an explicit motion. So I've already spoken with Gabriel about that. Um, and yeah, that's what I would like to do. That's my plans. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, Jason? Uh, nice PowerPoint, Brandy. Good Thank job. You. <laughs> I appreciate the data. I always learn something from you. Um, you know, the Homeless Connect Day, I didn't see that on there. You know, I think that, yes. you know, we're just, uh, 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 we're a mighty board, but, you know, this is a, an event that's already extremely successful. And I think it's another opportunity for us to, you know, energize ourselves and, <laughs> you know, give back in terms of, you know, finding a way that we can support such a fantastic event. And like, for those of you that aren't familiar, the, the, and you can explain it too, but uh, yeah. as far as I, from what I've seen, you know, they were doing haircuts and they were doing showers and they were connecting them with services and they had clothes and they had stuff for their animals. And, you know, this is really a, an event that supports, you know, the people in the community. So um, that's just, I want to, um, I think like for me, mm -hmm. a town hall is great, but I think it's like, there's something already that exists. And I think that we can just kind of piggyback on that and like support it in that respect. Not, I'm not against doing a town hall, but I just think that that's an important component. So I wanted, I wanted to throw that out there. Um, and then I had uh, just a couple other things to say. I'm, I'm, I'm now a student at uh, LBCC, that's Long Beach City College. And one of the things that they've done is they're allowing their homeless students to um utilize their campus for like kind of a safe parking thing yes so i just wanted to um throw that out there i don't know if you know sometimes maybe i can uh, should tell you something you don't know but <laughs> i thought that was a really interesting um thing that they were taking up i mean long beach is really um i was talking to my teacher about it they they really have have you know, they're a good model to look at what they've done. They've, they've been extremely uh, successful. But um, my last comment is like, you know, bear in mind, we're the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. So when I look at homelessness, I'm looking at it in the confines of, you know, the five or seven homeless individuals, or, you know, RVs that we have parked within our boundaries. So that's, just how my mind works, but I, I appreciate where you're at. You're looking at it on a very, you know, global level, but, you know, the RV issue is something that I think that would fall under, you know, the homelessness. Mm -hmm. I agree the sanitation is an issue, you know, you got yeah. guys in their RVs, you know, where are they putting their trash? Because if you look across the street in the freeway, I don't know if they dumped all that trash there, but there's trash everywhere, right? So I think that, you know, we can support our homeless population here by, you know, providing things to them that they need or mitigating the impacts that they're causing on the community. Because if there's trash everywhere, you know, that's understandable. We all generate trash, right? It's not their fault that they generate trash, but there has to be a way that we can mitigate you know, so it, it's not, it, there's two sides to it, you know, and, and I, and I want to really focus and drill down on the individuals in our community, 
You know, that's really what I want to encourage you to, to think about is locally here because we represent our money is given to us to do stuff here in our boundaries. And if there's ways that we can, even if it's cleaning up after them or providing trash cans or, you know, that's, or giving food to them or, you know, things like that. I think that we really need to think about like our core group and then expand out. But, you know, I, I would encourage you to not get as caught up in the, the citywide issues. That's more of an advocacy thing, but for us and our budget and our money and what we do, I think it's, you know, we really gotta, gotta, um, do the outreach and, you know, do the events and, and all that. So, you know, just some comments, no, nothing, no, no judgment. You know, that's just how my mind is working. And I'm, I'm, I'm an open book, you know. Great, great comments, Jason. And, you know, what, what, a lot of what you just said is a perfect example of when you're so far into something, it's hard to know what you should be talking about to people who aren't as far into it. Cause like you, you'd mentioned connect day and safe parking, which are both things I've worked through uh, Wavna with as well as through our committee, but I didn't think to call them out because the, they're just they're just kind of background noise of something that we just do. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. Those are like the Connect Day was actually what we did the job fair through, for example. Um, and we need to do more of those. For for those who aren't familiar, the Connect Day is usually about a month, uh, once a month, but there are different ones in different areas. Um, and and yeah, it'll bring together services. And one of the biggest problems that we had before COVID hit and we had to stop doing them for the most part was trying to help a lot of the homeless people get to the Connect Day because there was a short window when we could get everybody together and also finding locations that would support enough people became issues. So we can absolutely continue supporting that. Um, and we, we tried before COVID hit to get the next Connect Day to actually be in Porter Ranch and uh then COVID hit but don't give up don't give no, up we can do it you know we got shepherd shepherd will do it you know we got we can do it here you know and we can we can support transportation for people you know so yeah and that's that's what so let's do I something be, here <laughs> I, I will absolutely be going back to pitching that um you brought up the safe parking and the the college it, it, is a, it is a fact that, um, especially what they call transitional youth, 18 to 24 year olds, which make up the majority of college students, are a spiking homelessness group. And so a lot of colleges have been trying to find ways to help their students not be homeless. And one of them has been safe parking. But this is also an example of where we need to work with our neighbors because uh, there are so many restrictions on what someone has to have in order to run a safe parking space that it ends up having to connect multiple neighborhoods together to do it. Uh, so, but that's a, that's a good thing that we've been a part of. Um, and the, the other thing is, you know, I, I, I talked about like Skid Row, for example, because that's the, that's the one we have numbers on as far as how many toilets and all that. It's the, it's the obvious example, but we have that problem here too. There's, there's, you know, there, you mentioned like five homeless. I, I know more than five homeless who sleep in one of one area down the street. Like we have a lot more in our community than you might think because most of them know how to keep themselves invisible. And they have the same problem of not always being able to get to a bathroom. And so these issues are both local and broader to the city in part because especially we have one of the very few family uh, shelters near us. And so families are more likely to uh, be brought out here because there's so few family shelters in the, in the entire county, um, even outside of the county. It's just, it's just not something that there's very much of. And it's also important to know, like, if you get into a shelter, like a family shelter, domestic violence shelter, any a men's shelter, any shelter, you have between 30 and 90 days of sheltering, and then they kick you out. They're, they're, you run your garment, you're done. You cannot go back to that shelter ever. You're kicked out. So that means a lot of people who are in the sheltering system, because it generally takes more than one to three months to get out of homelessness, means that they're going from one shelter to another, to another, to another, until they've used up all the shelters. So people who are not in our district might end up getting pulled into our district because, of, because they've run out of shelters. And 
So it, it, that's what makes this that weird space where we have to look at very hyper local in things like our outreach, but also look at the city when we talk about advocacy, because it's going to it's it's going to spread out one way or the other. But yes, you are absolutely right about making sure, especially when we talk about our funding, which almost none of what I talked about was funding related. Uh, I believe in keeping that mostly in our community. Um, so you're right. Uh, David, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, you know, I, I appreciate the, like Jason, I appreciate the enthusiasm, uh, but to be perfectly honest and clear, the residents and stakeholders that have approached and emailed me um, aren't concerned about adding porta potties. They don't want to, they don't want that to even consider that being done. They want to know why we are working harder to get the RVs towed or to get the tent at Reseda and Rinaldi removed. And, you know, and not to be callous, I know we've got a lot going on with COVID. It's just devastated the numbers of uh, jobs we have and everything else that's, that's pushed this issue. Um, and not to be callous, but the, the 2020 count for Porter Ranch, if you look on the, on, the, on the map, it's 24. And that map erroneously includes areas south of the 118 as being part of Porter Ranch. So the figures you cited, including the 114 family members, that's for all of CD12. And like Jason, we really need to focus on Porter Ranch. I don't honestly care what happens in Hollywood. They run their show the way they run their show. And if they want to have hot dog vendors in every corner and they want to let the homeless, you know, live uh, in the medians underneath the Gower Bridge, that's their business. Um, you can go off the Gower Street off ramp right now and smell yep. the urine before you yep. get to the bottom of the stop sign. You know, I was I was in Delaware last month for a wedding. And when people found out I was in L.A. universally several times, they said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I said, for what? And they said, I've seen the videos, the homeless people and everything else. And gas is $4 a gallon. It, it was three and a quarter in Delaware last month. And That's they so talked fine. specifically about the homeless crisis. Right. And they're seeing, you know, national news yeah. coverage of this. And, um, you know, it's, I don't know what, what more we need to do to help the 24. I'll give you the, I'll let you double it, say it's 48 because of COVID. That's 48 people out of 35,000. I mean, we're a small city. I grew up in a town of 600 people. The nearest town next to me was 11,000. This community is 35,000, and we might have perhaps 48 people that are homeless. We need to find them housing and permanently, but once that's available, once permanent shelter and housing is available, we can't just keep allowing people to build, live in RVs. It's got to stop at that point. Until they have housing, that's one thing, but once that's available, at some point, we've got to say enough's enough. You've got to get a job. You've got to right. find a way to get out of that RV. Now, you can't just dump the sewage in the curb along Rinaldi. You've got to drive it to pump out station. Well, it doesn't drive. I'm sorry. You can't just dump sewage in the street. And that's what the people that contact me want done. They don't want to hear about adding porta potties. <laughs> so, so you brought up a really good point, um, which comes back to something I said in my, in my presentation, that of, of the counted 66,000 people that are homeless, we only have shelter capacity for less than half of them. So like you said, once there's enough sheltering, then we can start doing some more aggressive movements that we can't do right now. Our hands are tied because there's nowhere to put them. And you know, you also made the, the correct uh, point about RVs are, are an issue that we hear about over and over again. And I think that's a really important reason that uh, I like Becky wanting to open up the traffic safety uh, committee because like I've told her before, I think that there is a lot of overlap between issues that homelessness and issues that traffic and safety run into. Um, because we're not a traffic committee. So there's, you know, there, there's advocacy that I've done and there's advocacy, advocacy, advocacy I can do, but I, I'm not in charge of the traffic laws side of things. So we need to be working together to get those things to work. And right. I'm sorry, I forgot one point also before I forget my train of thought. The, um, and I, you know, the, you mentioned the count. I mean, I know, I know people that did the count. They don't just walk by tent and count at one. They're knocking on the tent. They're shaking the tent. Sir, hello, ma'am, anybody home? They're trying to get an accurate number. I don't know where. Yes, they're trying. Where you, I don't know where you thought, that, where, you, where you're getting the, the perception that a, a tent is counted as one. If no one answers a tent, yeah. But they do try to say, hey, is anybody there? Can you please open up? They're very enthusiastic about getting a correct count. And. You know, at some point, Brandy, you know, we need to call a spade a spade and say, your XYZ homeless encampment, why do you have 45 bikes and parts for another 300 
and 15 baby strollers. That's got to, it's got to get addressed from that perspective, not just, oh, it's a shame. Let's get you some more food. I mean, it's got to be comprehensive and that's part of the problem. So I, I do want to address, because I don't, I don't want anybody to think having been a volunteer myself, that I'm in any way insulting the volunteers. There is an actual guidance that for, uh, that for encampments that are too dangerous, you just point to, you just count by the tents. And like you said, if they're not home, which happens quite frequently, you just count it as one. If you can get an accurate count, you try. You always try as long as it's safe. But we have to recognize that the, the singular tent count thing is, a, is an issue, as is families that are homeless but not visible, as are families and individuals who are homeless and double counted on rare occasions happens. So there, the count is never going to be anywhere close to accurate, but when you talk to nonprofits and when you see the difference in the data from like LAUSD, which works directly with the homeless students and the number of, of minors that the L entire LA County count has, you start to see the drastic amount of difference in what our count is saying and what are otherwise numbers are saying elsewhere. So I can't give hard and, hard and fast numbers, which is why I shy away from saying it. But if you get into this, you can start to see it is nowhere near close to accurate. Um, and yes, you're right. Some of the numbers are CD12 in general, and they try to go down to Porter Ranch. But that's hard because especially when you have cleanups, people don't stay in one area or they might cross the street and suddenly be counted as a different place. And People do have RVs and cars, and sometimes they're allowed to park in one spot for a day or two, and then they have to park somewhere else. So they drive somewhere else, and then they drive back three days later. So there's a lot of movement within the homeless community, and that makes it really hard to get an accurate count. So it makes sense to look at kind of a district, a, a, a city council district, because that gives you kind of the upper end of what you're looking at within your neighborhood. So that's 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 the, the metric that we tend to look at, but that is just because we don't have these good, accurate numbers. Hilda. Hello. Um, I, want, I really want to thank you for what you're doing. I know you did your homework and you're going to continue doing this and I'm glad you're doing it and it's not me, okay? <laughs> and because I can do other things, but I cannot deal with the homelessness. I just, uh, it could be that I get very emotional maybe, maybe if when I see the kids, like you said. So mm -hmm. just a few things I want to bring up in May, uh, our, since I work for Keller Williams Real Estate, uh, we have a red day. And this year in May, we, uh, I volunteered, I put up 25 baskets and I called my friends, my family, who can help me fill up this basket. This basket was filled up with so many stuff from shampoo, conditioner, um, you tell, I mean, everything that uh, you can imagine that a homeless person would need or an individual would need, okay? So they went to Van Nuys. I don't know where they went. I, I brought them to the office and my, uh, my, even my office, I got them everyone to contribute from socks, from hats, from everything that you would think of that an individual may need. So they went. We haven't heard anything or whatever, it doesn't matter. We, we know in our heart that we did contribute, okay? So my other question is, yes, the, the guys did bring, bring up the RV. Yes, there's few RVs on Rinaldi. There's few RVs. There was, there was a last a weekend, like maybe eight days ago, there was an RV that was on fire on San Fernando Mission. All the firefighters were there. And now that, that RV moved up to Reseda and San Fernando Mission. And it's just sitting there. It just doesn't look good. And then people get off the freeway and this guy is sitting, a guy, a girl, I don't know who it is. And my question is, is anybody knocking on his tent and saying, hey, do you need help? Are you, can you just move from here? This is a, it's a neighbor. I mean, it's a residential area. Uh, if they want to go to somewhere else, let them there. The city is providing housing, but they don't want to live there. And people do question me and I don't know what the answer is. I'm not going to go up there and then knock on that tent. Now, I just noticed today um, he has a new tent. Somebody obviously got him a tent. It's a new tent now. It's not even, it's mm -hmm. a new tent. So who's going to go knock on that tent and say, hey, do you need, you have, you need anything? Can you just move? Uh, you know, there's housing out there. 
I mean, they can't just sit there. It's a park. It's a residential area. We're tax. We're paying taxes. That's great I mean, questions. Th those right? are those so are great who's going to do that, Brandy? Who's going to do that? So, <laughs> so when so, when the public asks me, so at least I know the answer. I can't just right. say I don't want to brush them off like an other politicians that they do. I'm that's not me. When I commit to something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to complete it. I'm not going to be selfish. I'm going to I'm here for the people. So um, th this guy is not he's not supposed to be there, period. He is, there were a couple with their dog behind Keller Williams office. And as soon as I walked in and I told the uh, management, I said, what is going on? I mean, I sometimes leave the work uh, late and I don't, I'm, I'm scared. You know, mm -hmm. it's not right because they're causing a lot of problems. So Brandy, who is going to knock on that tent? Great questions. And God, I love your passion, dear. Um, okay. So there are actually a number of people who probably are already knocking on their tent. One of them is, is the hope teams, which are run through, uh, LACDP. Um, so they're the home, they're, they're the police department's homeless outreach group. They, they often go to, uh, places if citizens have informed them that there's an encampment or there's a homeless person that they think is either in danger or is uh, causing danger or it's disruptive or anyway, they, they're one of the key point of contact groups for city. Lahasa has a lot of outreach groups and advocates that they hire to go out and look for people like that. And if, if somebody has reported it to the city and reported it to the county, then it could get to them. There's also a ton of nonprofit outreach groups and and government and neighborhood council outreach groups like me who will go and you know if you can give me the the, the send me an email later with the the location and I'll see yeah, what I can no, do. It's it's very simple. It's Rinaldi yeah. and uh, Reseda. Um, yeah, no Rinaldi and Reseda north northwest corner by the little park, the cutest park. Right. It's right there. Just send, and, me, and people, send me an email so I remember. Send me an email. And you know, so I, I will. I will. And then, you know what's interesting is people our neighborhood are telling me. Hilda, um, people were dropping off food for them. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. You're feeding them, but you know, don't encourage them too much. Let them go work. As we are working, waking up in the morning, going and paying our taxpayers, and we're paying our mortgage. We have so much to do. They need to do the same thing. I understand <laughs> it's hard, COVID, but they're taking advantage of us. I just want to tell you, they're taking so, advantage of us. So, okay. Um, so I, I was an unhoused child, so I'm very familiar with how it works from that end. Um, let me tell you, it, it's not as simple as it sounds. First of all, almost a, a very, very small portion of them have access to a car. So they're already relying on our, let's face it, awful public transit system. Um, they might get a call and there's, there's free cell phones that they can get. Um, so they so directly to keep them connected with their, their services people, but we don't give them any electricity to plug in their phone. So if their phone stops being charged, then they miss a phone call. Mm -hmm. um, they might have to go every so often to go in person to the office of their, their social worker who's connecting them with stuff. And that person might say, okay, you have to go to this, uh, you're required to go to this job training thing in order to get this thing so that you can have an, you can have this uh, thing so that it allows you to eat like money or mm -hmm. they might have to so they might have to travel like across town to go there and then they might be told they have to travel back across town or several miles out of the way to go to this one place that's offering only breakfast and it's first come first serve mm -hmm. and so they may get there they may or may not get to eat now they have to travel several miles somewhere else to find somewhere where they can get lunch and then they may have to travel somewhere else because they have to do another class that they're required to do in order to stay in the system. And then they have to travel somewhere else to go get dinner. And all this while, if they don't get to the drop-off point for a shelter by usually between 6 or 8 p.m., depending on the, the individual shelter, mm -hmm. then they're out of luck. They're not allowed to go to the shelter that night. And so if they've missed the location deadline with all the traveling they had to do, they're out of luck. Well, they're going to have to and be responsible. To every I mean single day. And they have to do this every day or they don't yeah, eat. That's fine. Really having to travel somewhere to wash your clothes. We're doing the same thing, Brandy. We're doing that's called being responsible. Yeah. They well, yeah, but you have doing the same thing. And you have, you have all that in your house. You don't have to travel probably more but than- But we worked for it. I, I worked since I was- sweetie. 
Many yeah. of them are working. Many of them are working and have jobs. Some of them are government job workers. Really? Yes, a lot. That is a common It's good to know. I mean, it's good to know, but yeah, about not a I'm on this call still. What's there, that? There, so let's look at the numbers again from this. No, that of the 75,000 plus people that exited homelessness, only 22,000 were placed into housing by either nonprofits or government entities, 52,000 of them self-resolved, meaning they were able to pull themselves out within that year. 52,000 people were able to do that in this time frame. So there are plenty, the majority of them are doing that, but that doesn't mean that they're not stuck in a bad position for a few weeks or a few months because it's, it's, our system is not well set up and our services are laughably lackluster. I mean, it's, let's it's work awesome. on it. Let's work on port yes, around, exactly. let's clean them up. Let's, let's do that. Let's, clean them up. let's, let's let... focus on this tent on Rinaldi and um, Rosita and uh, let them, I, I'm not saying throw them away, just right. put them somewhere, let them accept. Some of, some of them are not accepting shelters. They don't want to be in shelters. They don't want it. They love the luxury living in a nice park. And okay, we're going to have winter. We're going to have rain is going to come. It's going to be freezing. I feel for them too, but somebody has to do something about it. Knock on that tent and say, move them there. Move yeah. them out of there. People do not walk. In. They're scared to walk. Families are scared to I walk. I have to chime in. I'm sorry. Um, let, let the yeah. other. Um, Becky's, okay. Becky's next. Is that okay? If I'm done. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Sorry. Uh -huh. It's really quick. I live on Reseda and Rinaldi. The tent you are talking about, his name is Eric. Um, Eric okay. has been there for quite some time. Um, and he did leave for one day last week. I went down to see um, if he took all his stuff, everything was gone. He actually moved back the next day. A neighbor had bought him a tent. They were helping him set up. From what I understand, he has been offered multiple times housing. He has refused. They, uh, the neighbors around gave him $300 for food. Um, he has housing offered to him. Section eight is offered, offered for him. He loves that the neighborhood is kind to him. The residents are giving him food. They buy him new tents every so often. They just helped him set it up. So in that sense, they're enabling him to stay. Um, at this point, yep. why would he leave? Why would he leave if they're bringing him these Costco bottles of water, new tents, new clothes for him to wear? Why would he take advantage of government assistance if he's comfortable? Why would he go get a, why would he go work? There's no reason he don't need to go get look for a job like the rest exactly, of us. Exactly, exactly. I mean, from what I see, I've seen him quite a bit. He looks healthy. He looks fine to me. Um, but he loves the kindness of the neighbors. And there are multiple threads on Nextdoor mm -hmm. app about him. Um, and yep. you'd be surprised how many neighbors go and check on him, give him food, buy him things he needs, give him cash. Um, and gosh, I don't know if they refuse housing legally, what can the city do? There's restricted amount of things that we can do. And some of us have been trying to pass new state laws to allow us to do more. Um, and there, that's, that's been a fight for years, trying to allow us to be able to basically force somebody into sheltering or force them in, into some situation. So basically right. they can stay right. on the street. Eric, 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 we all, yeah. we all know Eric. I was afraid it was going to be Eric. Eric is like the poster child for what a lot of people mistakenly think is the majority of the homeless population when it's really just like a tiny handful of what some of us in the advocacy group refer to as the PIAs, which is pain in, you can guess what the A word is. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are have no problem being very visible, being problematic, and they make it, they are the ones, they're like, if you have that one racist neighbor that makes everyone in the neighborhood look bad. And that's, that's what that guy is. That guy is that one jerk that you can't get around dealing with him. And they're the ones that end up like, there is a shrinkingly small percentage of the homeless that take up the majority of the services and the majority of the funds. 
And if we put more effort, which is something I've been pushing for a long time into the vast majority of people who don't need to, we don't need the Eric's to be the ones that we spend all our time focusing on. We need to be focusing on these other people who just need a little bit of help because if we get them out of these situations faster, if we get them either not to be unhoused in the first place or get them housed and, and, and set up faster, then we reduce the percentage of homeless, we reduce the amount of homelessness. So we can then turn around and have these shelter capacities to push the Eric's off of the street and push the Eric's into doing what they should be instead of being, uh, being annoying and making it look like everyone ones like that, but they're the visible ones. And that's the biggest problem. Unless you're involved in this, you're not going to see the good people. You're not going to see the invisible people. And that's the biggest problem. But I agree, he's a pain. <laughs> like, yeah, and I will, I will advocate again to see what we can do about, we'll call it the Eric problem. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Thank definitely you. like a long standing problem. <laughs> yeah, and and there's, there's a handful of them and anybody in City Hall knows, their, knows them by name and the advocates know them by name because yeah. they like that. Uh, Becky, your turn. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, pretty easy to answer. First of all, how many of these homeless people are products of the early release program and should um, be in a mental health facility? And they, they're not capable of taking care of themselves. They, we need right. to have mental health facilities. Um, and what, what role does the fact, I know that LA, I know the state of California has adopted this, but LA was the first to be a sanctuary city. How much does that play as a factor in our homeless population? The fact that anyone can come here across the border <laughs> and be assured that they'll get food and shelter um, and that we don't oh, have I enough see. mental health facilities for people <laughs> to go to when, when, I mean, you can't tell me Eric doesn't have some mental issues. He might. He I might. mean, if people, a guy lives a in a one of the busiest intersections in Porter Ranch, it's just a matter of time till a car runs the corner. You <laughs> like, know, it's so dangerous. I, I, it scares me to death. <laughs> so, so, unfortunately, they don't break down when they talk about how many thousand people have mental illness and they say it's 22 percent. It's this number. They don't break it down by people who are so severe that they can't take care of themselves versus people who are just like uh, people with autism or people with uh, long-term depression or something that doesn't necessarily need to be uh, institutionalized in any way. There, this is an example though of one of those laws I was talking about that we've been pressing for, which is a lot of changes to um, uh, the allowance for people who clearly cannot take care of themselves I, I, you know what, there, there's a segment of the population and I know that, you know, being a child and, and I know a lot of kids who were homeless. My yeah. mom ran a foster home. She probably had 100 kids that she took care of in her lifetime. Um, it's a huge issue, but, but I will tell you, these, all these children had mental health issues, severe. Yeah. And a lot of these homeless people, we need to open some mental health facilities to treat their, they don't want to live in a house. They yeah, it, they're not capable. I, I saw data a few years ago when I was working on a, on a documentary about homeless children that uh, homeless children are eight times more likely to develop a mental illness from living on the streets. So there is wow. a strong correlation to what happens. Um, it On top of that, so- uh, but Can I just, I'm joking, no the sanctuary city issue, how much yeah, I'll, I'll, does so, that play? Okay. So a big problem. Um, so, so, so let's, let, let, let's be clear. What do we, what we mean when we say a sanctuary city? So sanctuary city does not mean that you are in any way entitled to uh, food or shelter. What sanctuary city means is that um, when, if, if you have a decree from the federal government saying we would like you to hold somebody because we suspect they're in, uh, of undocumented status, you cannot, that you will not break the constitutional laws that have been upheld repeatedly and hold them without what's considered just cause. And every time, even a red state, even a hardcore- well, No, I know all of that. Wait, well, this I'm is just what, saying, this is well, I know that, but what, how need. much of a factor is it in the homeless population? Is there There's, a percentage of how many of these people are, um, <laughs> 
here because it's it's free. So there's no. Um, so again, it and they're coming like, from other Sanctuary states. They're busting them in. Sanctuary City doesn't doesn't change how much it costs to live in an area. It doesn't give you extra um, benefits. But uh, uh, what I can say is that they don't they don't break down. Uh, country of origin. What they do break down is how. Oh, but that's really not the issue. Well, no, no, no. But this is all I can tell you is the data. What they do break down is race and how long somebody has lived here. And it was around 80. Last the last data I saw, which was actually 2019, around 84 percent of LA County homeless people had been living here for 10 years or more. So they're not newcomers. They're not people who came here from out, out even outside of the county. They're people who are are locals. Um, but there's no, there's only a breakdown by race in demographics. There's no breakdown by nationality. So I can't say like, you know, 4% came from Mexico, 18% came from Canada. I can't, I can't give you the, that percentage because I don't have access to that. Okay. All I know is that the 86% that we saw were people who've been here for at least a decade. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy and Becky. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll have uh, a committee meeting soon where we can talk about all this more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I want, I want to end this topic. Let Jennifer, I know you've had your hand raised up. You finish your question. You're done. You're good to go. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to put it down. <laughs> no problem. I wanted to make sure. Uh, it's a, a, a interesting conversation he did, but you know. I, I agree. I agree. And that's why usually we can't have a discussion like this in a normal meeting, but today being the type of meeting it is, we can do what we're doing. But uh we have to move on, unfortunately, on this one. But it is a very important conversation. Obviously, everybody is passionate about, and it's definitely worth discussion. Or maybe we, that's a great committee meeting right there to have a discussion exactly like we just had right now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Next one is a sustainability committee. Uh, David Balin is not here, so we can move on. I will be short on mine, uh, land use committee. I don't have too much information at the moment, other than we are going to be calling for the meeting regarding the gas state, Walmart gas station that's being proposed. So that is going to be a discussion coming up soon. Updates uh, from Vineyards today. The hotel is going to break ground next month, the Hampton Inn. So that is final. It is breaking ground officially in one month. As you know, Lure Cafe and Habit did open up. My understanding is Lure is doing very good. Habit is, you know, uh, th that's, you know, Habit pretty much told me that a lot of the orders have been to go and also uh, delivery, I guess. But let's see. Hopefully, I wish everybody the best. Silver Lake Ramen also opens up in a couple of weeks is the latest update I got. But uh, most importantly, as I said, the gas station is the biggest worry for me. And we will be holding the committee meeting, probably a joint committee meeting, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, right after I was waiting for this meeting today to clarify everything and move forward. Anybody All have any- All we need is more gas in Porter Ranch. <laughs> right, we have, we have plenty. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm very concerned that the community is not aware of the gas station. Right now, I'm, I'm concerned because the only person that I know that knows about it is on another neighborhood council nearby, and they talk to me about it. And the only reason that they know about it is because they're on the land use committee in a neighborhood council near next to us, and they get those notifications. So I think that, you know, understandably, you know, we had a transition here, but I think that. I don't know if, if there's stuff, I don't follow a lot of social media, but I don't know if there's any stuff on, if it's not on next door, then probably nobody knows about it. And I think we have a duty to our community, the fact that we're, we're withholding this information from the community because we've known about this for a long time, but we haven't done anything on it. And I'm not trying to be critical of anybody, but I'm just trying to make the point that, you know, this is going to come just my experience in land use okay this is what they do nobody knows about it and then the hearing comes up and it just gets slammed down your throat and there's nothing we can do about it because it's already too late you know and, 
And so like, I feel like we're dropping the ball on this thing by number one, not doing outreach to the community to let them know that this application has come in. When did the application can't come in? Probably three months ago, four months ago. So, you know, um, I implore you to be like, when these applications come in, like, let's get them out there to the community so they can start talking about it. Okay. And let's not, because I feel guilty, honestly, that nobody knows about this and I know about it, you know, but I mean, I'm just one person. So um, for you. what are you suggesting? Do you think we should uh, have outreach, reach out on social media, announcing well, it, or getting thoughts about it to begin what, with? What I would suggest is reaching out to, to the developer and reaching out to, um, to um, the chief of staff who's in charge of land use at Councilman Lee's office. Um, I forgot the name. Oh my God. What's her name? The developer, the developer is very anti the project. John Lee's office is very anti the project. They are aware of it. So, so the, you got to You got to call the meeting. You just call the meeting and get it on the agenda because once it hits our agenda, then it goes out to 5,000 stakeholders and then everybody knows about it. So the, the problem is, is that we haven't had it on any of our agendas, right? And, you know, we need to invite the developer. We need to invite um, Hannah Lee. That's the name. Hannah Lee. It, you need to work with Hannah Lee and the developer and, and John Lee's office and invite them and, and, and ask them to come and speak on this item. And, you know, you have to ask the, and, and the contact city planning and I, I sent you the case number, but you can basically get all the plans from city planning. So all you do is take those to the meeting and you put them up on your screen share and you show them this is the plans that they submitted to the city. So until we're until we're actually like letting the community know that these plans have been su submitted to the city, we're really sitting on this information, you know, and um, and that's not. Like we need to hear from our stakeholders what their opinions are on this thing, because if if something gets slammed down our throat and the community doesn't like it, who's who are they going to look at? They're going to look at us. Totally agree. You know? So, um, Gabriel, good point. Yes, Gabriel, I want to add something to that. I totally agree with Jason, and like with with the type of work that I do, I have to disclose, and then as a committee right here we need to disclose what we know don't you think we should put it on our bulletin and let the public know about it and let them vote are we allowed i mean is the public allowed to vote at this point or is it too late already too early for it that's what that's too about. early too it. early yeah well, hilda but, what happens is what mm -hmm. happens is the developer submits an application with the city planning department so an application is gotten submitted and we get a notification of those applications. Mm -hmm. So there's some paperwork that's sitting at the city planning office right now, this public information. So right. we know there's an application, but what Gabriel's saying is it hasn't come to a vote or we don't even know if there may be no vote. Maybe there isn't even a vote required. Maybe it's just gonna go right through, right? We don't right. know yet because we haven't contacted Hannah Lee from the councilman's office. We haven't contacted city planning. We haven't invited the developer out. You know, we haven't had a meeting or a hearing on it. So like, those are the basic, you know, due diligence steps mm -hmm. that need to be done to get the answers to the questions that the stakeholders are going to ask. They're going to ask us, right. you know, is this already approved? That's like the first question they're going to ask, you know, what is the project? Tell us about the project. So we invite the developer to come to the to the community, come to the board, and you know maybe we have a special meeting just on on that. You know, land use special meeting for the board. You know, that's right. Do we know that. Should we? Yeah, I like that idea. Board meeting for let's land. Let's do that. Use. Let's do it. Let's do it. That way. Uh, let's use uh, Becky. We can't hear you. I want a couple things, and I know we have a couple new board members. Two things that you should download on your computer and you should memorize the Brown Act, which is about 500 pages, the Ralph Brown Act, 
absolutely download that and read it. The second one is the Porter Ranch specific plan. My question is for land use, is that gas station part of the Porter Ranch specific plan? That specific plan spells out anything that can happen in Porter Ranch. And as far back as I go, it, um, it, we didn't want any gas stations up here. And the specific plan may, I know that the council offices through the years have fought any gas stations coming up here. And now we're talking about putting a Costco type of gas station in the Walmart shopping center. And I was there today. It was nuts. And there's no gas station there yet. So I, I think we we should research the Porter Ranch specific plan and see what it says about that. It is not on the specific plan to my understanding. It was a, the, pro, the problem is that Walmart owns the property and they could do what they want with their property. It's not under original plans or the specific plans. But I think they only own the property that Walmart sits on. They don't any add own. Do they own the property? Yeah, Walmart the Walmart too? property goes yeah. all the way across to the to the little roads. Their property is a lot bigger than I expected. I didn't know that either. Yeah, I know that. Okay, okay. Really, just because it's not in the specific plan doesn't mean they can do whatever they want. No, it doesn't, but maybe no. it's spelled out in the specific plan. Yeah, I, I've read the specific plan many oh, times. I. And it's not, there's not, there, I don't believe there's any mention of any gas station, but there the isn't. specific plan is like a blueprint for the community. So you can't assume that the fact that it's not in there means that you know they don't have a power plant in there right you know they don't have a you know <laughs> there's a lot of things that aren't in there right the fact that it's nuclear power plant yeah yeah we, we don't have a you know that doesn't mean they can build a nuclear power plant here in Porter Ranch because no. it's not in there it doesn't but, work like that but you know? when I know how it works because when we built the school we had to change the specific plan to allow smaller density housing surrounding the school um, and the specific plan had to be changed. So I, I'm going to go look at it again and see if there's any language in there about a gas station. I, I'd like to know how they get away with what the EIR says, because the traffic mitigation plan that they have to create for that, I, I don't know how that even works. There's no way to write a traffic mitigation plan for that parcel the way it is now. So the EIR is going to be uh, remarkably important to start with and because it'll include that. So that's, that's a great point. Thank you, David. The IR is going to be quite essential, and the, as well as traffic mitigation. The two hidden glove are really going to speak to what they think they're going to get away with. Because, like Becky said, it's a circus up there any time of day. I love Costco, but if you go to Costco, the line to the gas station there is very long too. You add that, and you don't get one and one. You get one plus one is three. It's going to be bad. But Costco is not in a residential area. This is a residential exactly. area. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer. I agree. Sorry. Um, yeah, I completely agree with everything Becky and David said. Um, first of all, there's a lot of foot traffic where Walmart is. I actually didn't even know that they own the property. I thought Chappelle leased those um, that for them. I thought Chappelle owned that town center and they leased it from him. I think they own it was part of it, but they own part of it. But a couple of the places the big the box stores, they didn't want them to go vacant, so they made them buy the property. Got it. Okay. Um, and another thing, is it too early to start a petition, or is this already? No, it's not too early. Okay. We, we, this is something to discuss in the meeting, which I want okay. to talk to Gibson and see if I, how I can do a complete board meeting uh, okay. regarding this matter. So I will definitely stay in touch with the board regarding it, especially after today, we need to move forward. <laughs> Uh, I, I see Glenn Bailey has his hand up. Uh, floor is yours, Glenn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just a, a suggestion. I know you you have your way of operating and, and you do very well, but something that Northridge East has started doing about over a year ago, um, actually since COVID, um, once we get any type of a notice for a land use item that is discretionary by the city, we add it to our board agenda, even though we're not gonna consider it, it's noted as for informational purposes only. And we include on there whatever information we're, we receive, such as the um, address, what the request is, and generally we do have the case number and Sometimes, actually, usually, the uh, with the new um, 
procedure the city planning department has is they've uploaded the documents that they send out hard copies to the neighbor councils. So we put the link on our agenda to the city planning department's um, page that they've set up for that case. So that way, anyone, you know, it may be several months before the neighbor council, you know, is actually going to hear the case. But it 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 it's a way to provide for anyone who happens to be looking at the agenda, right? Um, to all the information that they need that this is something in the works, right? Because we've given them the description, the address, the case number, and the link. Just for and your consideration. What would you name that section? Will it be at, after the actual agenda in the beginning, or how, how are they doing it exactly? Uh, you could do it that way. We, we have a section in our agenda where we put in um, committees and... Okay. And then under our, our planning, under planning items, we have it broken up between local planning items and then citywide ones. And, uh, but we do make it clear because we had a developer question us. So we do make it clear, you know, for informational purposes, you know, not, it's on the agenda, but we're not going to be taking any action. And so, so we you make, won't be discussing it? We, I'm sorry? You don't even discuss it. So it's just on the agenda, just for informational purpose only. Right. Well, we may say, uh, like the first time it appears, we may say we received this application either from the email or maybe even the hard copy packet. Um, it and we've this is the first time that that it's showing up on our agenda, and we can say we'll be considering it a month or two months or once we make the arrangement. So we would briefly acknowledge it and just say this is new, um, or no update, or you know whatever we, yeah. So thank you. I like that idea. I appreciate it. And this can happen, well, I'm assuming, with not only a land use stuff, but with any committees or anything, correct? I guess so. Um, we just do it with the land, the planning and land use because um, just, again, the, the intent is to give notice to the community, which is exactly what you're mentioning, right? Thank you. That's, why, that's why I spoke up. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Jason? Um, I'll just show you really quickly, like how you pull this stuff up because it's important. You use this site called Zemus. Can you see my screen here? You see Zemus. So I put in the address for, for you know, 19821, and this is all the information. And see all these case numbers, see how the years. So go, go in and find the year that's the recent one. See this 2021? So you click on this link right here. And that gives you the case number. And so here it is, ENV 2021-4735 EAF. And see what it says here, proposed 24 seven gas station with canopy, underground fuel tanks, convenient kiosk and hardscape improvements. So um, Hilda, you might be familiar with Zemus. This is a real estate thing. When people are doing developments, you just type in the address and you can see all the things affiliated with so that's how you find all this information, okay? So just so you know how to um, how to get that. Thank you, Jason. Any other comments or questions? We should be definitely me moving forward on this one. So we have a few meetings coming up now. One is the special meeting on twenty second. We have a board meeting on the eighth, December eighth, which, which is a general meeting. And I'll be setting up the land use meeting uh, soon, which will be announced. Let's move on to the next item, which is uh, education, right? Yes. Hilda, cheers. Uh, if you have anything to add, I know oh. you're new. Okay, you're new. no, um, my plan is tomorrow I'm going to be talking to, I'm going to talk to Becky and I'm going to talk to Christine. And um, as much as I, I want to hear as much as you know possible. So uh, I'm familiar with most of the schools, but the one that Jace, Jason was mentioning, I'm not. I don't know the principal or anyone else. But I, I'm more than happy to meet them either on FaceTime or if they're willing to meet me in person. I have no issue with that. So um, if there's Anything you guys think I need to do other than what I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm just going to go out there and then, 
you know, ask if there's anything that uh, our committee can do or, you know, to help them move forward with their project if they need anything. So, but I may be wrong. So that's why I want to talk to a few of you guys because you have, you guys have the experience, but I'm willing to do the, the work. <laughs> so, I mean, if you guys want to add anything to that. Um, great start talking to the principals, introduce yourself mm -hmm. and move forward from there is a great start. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jason. Um, we have our governance meeting. I think it's um, it's coming up pretty soon. So I'll invite you and then you can meet everybody. And um, that would be a good start. You know, the governance meeting. Governance is where we talk about basically everything that's going on with the school. Um, we have a new principal, uh, Principal Price, and uh, David Geringer has been replaced. He got promoted to um, Chatsworth Park Elementary. So we have a new um, vice principal coming in, but I know I've been talking with um, the people from Castle Bay and they, they, are, they are looking to uh, get some support from our board. So I can introduce you to um, some of the people from PATH. PATH is the fundraising side of Castle Bay that you know we've given money to them in the past. So that we can, can, I can connect you up with, because they're always coming to me, you know, oh, you know, can, you think you help us out, but now I'm going to like pass the buck to you. Okay. Um, so you'll, you'll meet like some of the people, Linda and Ala, and, and I'll, I'm happy to introduce you. Uh, so, we have so I'm overseeing Castle Bay, Granada Charter, Northridge, just text me who. Well, basically it's PRCS. Porter Ranch Community School and Castle Bay are in our boundaries, but we do send our children to some of the schools that are not yeah. in our boundaries. Yeah. Granada, That's Chatsworth, weird. Nobel, I mean, even yeah. Frost. And um, so usually we, we support them to a lesser extent usually, but we primarily support the main schools okay. in our boundaries primarily so as long as i know the schools and then i'll do my homework i'll just get all the names some of them are i'm, I'm familiar with the principals because i give out scholarships in my daughter's memory so i, I they they know me but i want to go in there in a different way where i'm represent i'm i'm helping them this time it's a different it's a different totally different we'll invite you gabriel i'm sure can invite you to some of the stuff at prcs i'll work with you as well on the back end We'll just invite you to stuff and just when you can just yeah. join and, and yeah. you'll meet everybody. So basically I'm asking for their needs and then I'm coming back to you, to us and then presenting it and then we're going to discuss it, right? Yeah, just basically like introducing yourself as the chair of the education committee and that you're, mm -hmm. you're new on the board here. Yeah. And that, you know, we want to hear from you guys, you know, how we can partner together and support each other, you know? And, yeah. And, help yeah. the schools and yeah. if there's any kind Very of advocacy simple. that they need sometimes they need help in advocating for things too and that's where we can help them as well so it's so not I have, money so i have a question like i overheard i was at a, a gathering uh last weekend and i overheard like granada needs help with the band like there is the city provided money to them but the school is not contributing to the band. So basically the band is out there doing their own fundraising. Is this something that I get involved in? There's a neighborhood purpose grant. So usually they have like a, um, you know, a, a 501c3, a nonprofit, like PATH is Castle Bay's nonprofit. So they will come and they'll say, you know, we're asking for so much money for the band or like we gave to the robotics um, mm -hmm. team, we gave them money. So there's a, it's a neighborhood purpose grant application they fill out and then that will go to me because I'm the treasurer. I'll review it and I'll check in, make sure everything looks good. And then it gets placed on the agenda. And if you want to um, do it in your committee, you want to review it. Otherwise you just send it right to the board and then we can um, talk about it. And then you invite them to come, you, you keep in touch and let them know, hey, so you send it to me, I'll look at it, everything looks good, I'll send it back to you. You contact them and say, hey, it's gonna be on the agenda, make sure you send somebody to, to talk about it. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, I can help you as well, Hilda, as I said. Awesome. The, well, exactly. I mean, yeah, a couple of times and then I'll be, uh, exactly. I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Brandy? Yeah, um, 
I, I love that you're you're jumping into this. Um, so I was on the the previous education committee, and uh, something I, I would like to to see you take up if you're okay with it. Um, so my my son has special needs, and we were working toward um, a Porter Ranch event for special needs children, um, and we were also working with with the previous assembly member's office to try to push through a bill to get more funding to upgrade um, uh, playgrounds in the schools. So there were there were a few initiatives that we were working on that I'd love to work with you on if you're if you're cool with that. Let me unmute myself. Yeah, sure. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. Jason, you have another question? Oh, just one last um, comment just to give you some kind of um, direction with the you know, education, I know we tend to look, think of it as just purely schools, but actually education also has to do with things that are, you know, it could be educating in general, you know, it, it's all, it's not just schools. So, you know, don't, don't um, pigeonhole yourself into education, like strictly being schools, because I know this is a big thing with our former president, Esam, you know, he wanted us to do things. So like um, one of the things that we did, like Brandy's talking about, you know, special needs, right? Like doing, doing something, educating the community about special needs, right? So um, we also did like first aid and CPR classes. So the, those are educational classes yeah. that yeah. our board approved that we paid for. We hired the instructor and we offer those classes for free. So, um, you know, you, you not idea. only helped people, you know, get their first aid certification, which is a good thing for safety, but that, so education, think of it in a broad sense, you know, and there will be some overlap with, you know, maybe the town halls and stuff like that, but, but don't, don't pigeonhole yourself into just schools. You know, it, it could be, it could be art or it could be music classes, or it could be a, a host of things that just, you know, maybe it's safety awareness for, for, you know, self-defense classes. You know, we talked about a lot of different things, but there's a lot of um, education that we can offer for free that can benefit the community. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Becky has her hand up. Can't hear you, Becky. Am I good? There you go. Okay, just to tag along with what Jason said, CERT is a program that's run by the uh, fire department and it, it's all at CERT and uh, they have training all the time you learn CPR, how to put fires out, what to do in case of an earthquake. Um, that That's kind of a great educational tool and also public safety. So we'll work together on that. Question. Okay, so what about location wise? I mean, is there like I can get my office. I have a big conference room. It's like mm -hmm. it seats maybe 40. If I can get authorization from them to set it up for a weekend or an evening, or do we have to be? We have the school. We have the uh, Ranch Community School. Okay. We have Castle Bay we can use. Okay. We How have the you use your office? We, we have the library. My office is- I mean, what you said. Oh, my office is Tampa and Rinaldi. Right, that the, would be fine. Where the, where the post office is, it's just yeah. across, across from there. Plenty yeah. of parking in the back. I mean, I'm just I'm just saying if we don't have if the school is not available could that is that a, a plan B that's what I'm trying to say we have the library yeah. we have two big churches here that's you know, right we have okay the Korean church, so we, have we have plenty of church I okay mean, those, those people will all work with us you know yeah and be happy to support us and it's all within our boundaries yes okay There's a lot of options perfect uh, uh, folks this is David uh, Lasher I, I'm a cert instructor you know, so I could, I, I've taught a, several dozen people in that class and it's, it's, it's 20 to 24 to 27, 28 hours, depending on how you teach it, but it's, uh, I'm happy to teach that. Perfect. Thank you, David. Awesome. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, does anybody from the attendees have any questions or comments? In, in the CERT classes, you can find them on Eventbrite. If anybody wants, I got my cert, my CERT training done last year. But if you go on Eventbrite and type in CERT, um, you'll be able to get those classes. But we could certainly do them here 
if we get a venue for the police, the fire department. Good. I like it. The more the merrier, more activities Porter Ranch has, the prouder I will be. And the prouder you will be and the prouder the community will be. So uh, let's move on to the next item, which is the elderly committee. Jennifer? Yes. Um, so I have recruited Becky and Christine um, because we will be working closely with outreach since it does correlate together. Um, if I'm going to start doing like events outside, um, I was just kind of like hesitant only because of all the um, COVID restrictions and technically the elderly are high risk uh, in the community. So, um, but I think, you know, for next year, I think we're just going to go full speed ahead and start doing some events outdoors, like a music day, game night, movie night. Um, I was thinking about a walking club. I mean, we can just walk around the park and make friends. I mean, a lot of people need some companionship and I'm sure a lot of people are widowed, alone. Um, you know, we've been isolated for quite some time during the pandemic and the people that live by themselves uh, have it even worse. Um, so I was just trying to think of a little bit of um, fun activities, you know, not just like a bingo night or something like that, but um, I'd love to do, you know, some activities, um, incorporate some fitness, uh, music to me is great therapy uh, and we'll work closely with outreach, but I also, you know, Becky and I wanted to change the name of the committee. So maybe we will um, propose a new name. I don't like uh, the name elderly committee. <laughs> how, how about senior care? <laughs> I don't want um, the word senior or elderly. <laughs> okay. We'll leave it in your hand, Jennifer. Come up with a, you have a committee meeting and then you guys can change the name. Okay. And we also need a experienced. <laughs> Heavily experienced committee. <laughs> How about golden? Yes, that's funny. I actually like typed that as one of my notes. I'm like, how about the golden committee? Very positive. Yes. And just come up with a name and come up with a mission statement on your first meeting. Okay. And can, uh, well, when you do the mission statement, I think you'll get some inspiration for a good name. Great. I agree. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Any, Becky, you have any questions for her? I can't hear you, sorry. Still can't hear you. A little bit of history for uh, the uh, Holly Burnson Park. Our neighborhood council was involved in setting up this equipment in on the um, east side of the park that was set up for senior citizens. Mm -hmm. And um, if you ever walk the park, it's right around the pathway and our neighborhood council was involved in putting that in the park, Sue Hammerlin and Dick Rippey. Um, and I were involved in the committee that did that. So that that's a great idea, Jennifer. Thank I you. really like it. Thank you. Any other questions for Jennifer? You want and to add anybody in? else that would like to join? Sorry, um, I'm welcoming you know, ideas or whoever wants to participate, so. Definitely, just remember each board, each committee can have three board members on it, maximum. Okay. So, I'm so you know, for sorry. your <laughs> Does that uh, include the, ch ch uh, the chair? Correct, that includes the chair. So three total. Max, three max, correct. Okay. Uh, Mike, uh, you have your hand up from the attendees. The floor is yours. Yeah, how you doing? Pretty good. Uh, I just wanted to interject that uh, over at Granada Hill South, as part of uh, an incentive to, for CERT and to help them on their way, uh, we actually got them CERT kits. You can get them at uh, SOS, uh, fairly cheap for all the graduates. And uh, it really goes over big. Uh, also, as far as the seniors committee goes, uh, it's also uh, in the last couple of years, we have reached out to uh, convalescent hospitals and whatnot, especially seniors who have no family and they get, you know, uh, Christmas cards, happy Easter cards, happy Thanksgiving cards. It goes over big. So I just wanted to throw that in with you guys. Great ideas, Mike. So you're pretty much suggesting they send out cards to certain homes, elderly homes, et cetera, for holidays? Yes. I like it. 
Jennifer, you want to respond to that? She vanished. She vanished. <laughs> uh, that's a good suggestion. I was going to tell Jennifer. It doesn't. Isn't uh, I think Northridge West has a or it's Granada. Mike's with Granada Hills South. You have a you have a senior committee, right? And then is there someone else who has one too? I thought it was Northridge West too. Um, but I was going to suggest to Jennifer, if you go on their website, you know, uh, Granada Hill South and look at some of the old agendas that they have for their committee, it'll give you some ideas. So you're not, you know, reinventing the wheel, right? And you, you can partner too with the other councils, you know, like Mike is mentioning about the cert packs, you know, like, um, you know, anybody who wants to do something with, with those kind of classes. And then, you know, you get some really good ideas. I mean, I'm always like kind of following what some of the other neighborhood councils are doing. And like, you know, sometimes we're, we're stealing their ideas or we're, we're maybe partnering with them on something, but you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheels. I mean, they, they've tried and figured out what works and what doesn't work. And so, um, you know, when Mike comes here and tells you, you know, he, he's, he, he knows what he's talking about and, um, you know, not everything works, but let, let them figure it out first. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> and then you heard, Jennifer, you heard his suggestion about uh, car, holiday cars and et cetera. Um, I'm sorry. I had to run to the restroom. <laughs> so that's why I ran off. I didn't think I was going to take that long, but when I heard my name, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> uh, he, he mentioned that it's a good idea to like do cards and et cetera for the elderly. And he, he had a few other suggestions. Okay. But I recommend if you have any questions, you can contact him. I can give you his information after the meeting. Great. And uh, you guys can discuss, uh, or, you know, piggyback thoughts as okay. a start, especially as a brand new committee. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you guys still hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I just think uh, it's uh, high time that uh, councils in general, uh, we all work together. Definitely. Definitely, I agree. Right. Sound, sounds great. Thanks, Mike. You bet. Thank you, Mike. Studio once again. And we have one more hand. Becky, you have your hand up again? I do. Mike, it is a question for Mike. Do you guys have a committee for seniors in, in, your, in your neighborhood council? Are you there, Mike? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll text them. I had to unmute again. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, yes, that is absolutely true. We have uh, seniors uh, on, under education. We have a youth committee as well. So do you call it a senior committee? It's combined. Yeah, we call it senior uh, seniors. Oh, okay. It's a youth and senior, right? You combine your your education with your seniors, right? Poor Hilda. No. no. <laughs> Oh yeah, as far as the meeting goes, yeah, we have it on the same night. They go hand in hand, and uh, and then uh, we have the uh, youth, and we have uh, the co-chair is actually a very brilliant young lady who's just really doing wonders with uh, other youth and getting much of the high schools involved. Thank you. So you have both all all three meetings on the same night. Yeah. At the same time, or just spaced out, or uh, back? To back? Well, they, they, they do the uh, education and youth. Uh, pretty, you know, the youth goes right after them, okay. and uh, and then followed by seniors. Uh, it doesn't take that long. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. You bet. Anytime. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer. Looking forward to your success in your committee. Thank you. Let's move on to the last one, which is the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And this will be Voss. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, I am unmuted. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the reason for this, uh, there is some delay is that because the Department of Neighborhood and Empowerment in partnership with the office of the city clerk and the office of the city attorney was making updates in the bylaws. And they have just completed that uh, template as uh, Gibson was also saying. And this uh, template contains the following element. It is a required table of contents 
it also has section that are mandated by the city or the bank and the section developed at the discretion of the neighborhood council for the section developed by the neighborhood council department's template offers recommendation you should take into consideration when making the changes to the bylaws and uh, this one this has four parts also uh, one is in the red part and red part says this text cannot be modified and must appear in your bylaw so as far as i understand i think even if we have the bylaws if they are not conformity with the red uh, uh, part language we may have to amend that also the next color they are given is the yellow color that says optional language or possible choices that are need to insert your text in that bylaw and the third one is gray part gray color that re belongs to the comments reference to government documents departments recommendation this text won't appear in the final bylaws and then the example is green one that is recommended by the department of empowerment or just a moment or the office of the city clerk so we will have to discuss all these things and we have to have amend amend the law by laws also and i also have under my consideration there are some like uh, uh, the uh, the committee which was under the old board they had some um, minutes which have been approved by the committee but they are yet to be presented to the board and uh, they are also like on the youth committee and uh, they are also have some uh, other one controversial clause which i think we will have to discuss that is on the president's uh, uh, making the agenda and then we have another item that is to add another uh, by law that was a motion which was approved in the august 11th meeting and that was a motion was passed that motion is to appoint president to speak to agencies on behalf of the board after discussion and vote and the vp as an alternate when the president is not available this motion was passed with the quorum 7 to 3 on august uh, uh, september meeting so that i have to add also and then there are certain new bylaws Uh, which uh, relate to this uh, new template so that was the reason of the delay and now i am waiting for the last meeting uh, that last meeting is going to be held on november 30th that is on the core module 3 they have module 1 module 2 now this is the model 3 that is a final meeting and there was some code of conduct meetings also they also involved some bylaws so after the 30th meeting i will start working on that i will set the ball rolling after that and then we will go from there thank you boss anyone yeah. have questions for our boss questions or comments jason i mean I, I, i'll just like make the comment that basically the the city all they're saying with all that color coding thing is they're going to they're going to cross check everything that we're saying we want to put in our bylaws with bonk policy right so they're right. saying you know some of the things that we approve maybe i don't know what the colors are maybe they're in red they're not going to go through but right. that doesn't mean that we have to wait you know we we plow through because nothing's going to change at the end of the day whether we do it now or later they're going to say no if they're going to say no or they're going to say yes if they're going to say yes we're under their their control you know at the end of the day they can say no like we can approve a bylaw change but they can say no they're still figuring out things on their end in terms of compliance with you know state law changes so so they're working all out their stuff but don't feel like we need to you know we don't need to wait on them because by the time we get to where we voted and agreed on what we want to do they'll have finished and then everything will come together so i just wanted to kind of give you give you those comments and 
yeah, you know, we did have a lot of discussion and I appreciate you coming to those meetings that, that we had with the bylaws. I mean, I was on bylaws last time and um, I think that it's a new board now. And I think that, you know, you're starting fresh. Um, but I think that, you know, the presentation that, that um, Gibson made that keep in mind that the bylaws are really pretty narrow. Okay, if you looked at that first slide that he had, there was really only like four or five things that bylaws really are in charge of, you know, and it's a lot of it has to do with funding and transparency around funding. A lot of it has to do with compliance, public meetings, you know, the um, stakeholders, you know, so it, it is really kind of kind of narrow the scope of bylaws and a lot of the things that we need actually fall under standing rules because you know bylaws are kind of like just the bare bones minimum for um and you might want to get those slides from um from uh from gibson because they're very they're they're very helpful especially that the first uh couple slides there um so anyways those are just a, just a couple of things i wanted to yeah, the basically what I understand is that bank will be the controlling authority, whatever we make, but we will make from best from our side and leave it on the bank. And the, uh, the bank is the final one. It is above done. So the as far the policy matters are concerned, bank will be the final authority, and they can also have the authority that they can supersede our standing like um, bylaws at any time. That is the authority, they have the control over that, like in case of a dispute or something, they, they will supersede our bylaws in case of some situation like that comes up. And the second thing is that uh, they, they are making changes. One of the changes is that in future, the neighbor councils will be able to amend the bylaws only in the non-election years. You get what I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, done so. is important to, you know, you want to make sure you have Gibson involved because yeah, yeah, Bonk, yeah. Bonk is only looking at really specific things, you know, um, but Gibson will help to kind of, um, right. Gibson um, is a big asset because he he's familiar with bylaws throughout yeah. all the neighborhood councils. So his suggestion and looking at, at other councils bylaws yeah. and other councils standing rules you know, ask him to send you some good examples because, yeah. you know, they've done a lot of work and right. we can kind of pick and choose what right. we think might work for us. Right, right. So we will go with the, in coordination with the Don, where Gibson will come up and Don will forward to the bank. And then the bank, I think there will be the city clerk or city attorney will also be involved when it is finalized. So they will also be involved. So Don is the basic thing. As far as we are concerned, Gibson will be our advisor or we can go to him. We will submit the pilot amendments to the Dunn. Dunn will review it. They will forward to Bank. Bank will decide on it. And finally, I think it will go to city clerk or city attorney's office as well. That is my understanding. Perfect, thank you. So we, will see. we will see how we go from there. But Gibson will be definitely a key figure we will have to coordinate with him. That I agree with you. Per his request as well, you wanted to be at the meeting. So we'll definitely have him there. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? We do have one. It is from Glenn Bailey. Floor is yours. Thank you, Glenn Bailey. I just wanted to clarify the bylaws process. Um, Voss, you know, did a good uh, overview, but there's a couple specifics. Um, Bonk sets policies, but so does city council. Um, and so some of those, some of the things that can't be changed in the bylaws are because of ordinance, because of action of city council. Some of the items are because of policy of Bonk. The bylaws, your bylaws, all the neighborhood council bylaws only go to Bonk at this point if you're doing a board structure change, right? If you're taking one of your board members, you're increasing or reducing the size of your board, or you're changing the name of the position, like let's say you add a youth member. That's a board structure change that goes to bonk. The only other thing that goes to bonk is if you have a boundary adjustment, right? But you're kind of landlocked amongst, you know, your surrounding neighborhood council. So, you know, that doesn't, that happens, but not that often. Those are the only two things that go to bonk. 
So Don Every, is approving it? Then it goes, yeah, so it goes to the NEA. So wh whoever is your NEA at the time of submission, so Gibson or whoever it is, they have the primary responsibility. That is part of their job uh, description. They have the primary responsibility to go through and evaluate any changes you made because you have to give them a, a strike through version from the existing to what you're proposing and they have that primary responsibility. It then goes to a supervisor in Dunn who would then sign, up, sign off on it and then you would get it back either as is or with any adjustments with an effective date of that. So I just want to make sure you know uh, there is after bonk, there is no city, there is nothing else. And it only is a, a regarding those two items I mentioned. Just so, so you're dealing with, as you indicated, you're dealing with your NEA, you're dealing with the supervisor, and that's basically done signing off on it. And um, that's it. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, quick question it's off of, actually, I'll wait until this topic is done. Any other questions for Voss? No. Thank you, Glenn. Glenn is always a great resource. <laughs> Thank we you, appreciate Glenn. you, Glenn. Voss, do you have anything to add or you're, I can't hear you, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I have to ask Glenn a, a question if he's there. He's here. Okay, Glenn, my question is that we had a, a rules and bylaws committee meeting in April and I got the letter on August 10th. So my question is that minutes have to be approved by the board. We have to give a present to the board. And my question is when we are making the amendments, can we submerge all these one or two meeting minutes together to get it approved by the board or they have to go individually? You can combine them all because you're, you're um, I would think you would want to, even though there's no restriction that I'm aware of, you, you can submit multiple bylaw amendments to to done but it's probably be less confusing if you did them all at once so yeah, how you how, how you get to that point because you've had multiple meetings over the months right um you can just then present it to the whole board the board even if the board takes These are you know, committee meetings glenn he's yeah, talking about are, committee meetings right, committee right. Meeting right. minutes are approved in the committee but, but they're, they're not approved by the board. They're not approved by the board yet. Not approved by the board. So the we can make one, is, we can combine all of them and make one amendment proposal. Here's well, your problem. This is your problem. The problem is your committee members are no longer there. And and how can you who's gonna because usually if you weren't in the meeting, you wouldn't vote on it, right? You would recuse yourself. So how are you gonna approve minutes from a meeting when you, the members aren't even there? So that, that's a that, question for Gibson. That was my question for Glenn at this time. Then later on, it will be for Gibson. Yeah. So I think the important issue, I mean, the, the approval of the minutes, yeah, it's it's within the committee. But the important issue is if if in the action taken in the committee resulted in a recommended bylaw amendments, that's got to go to the board for the board approval. And you can do multiple approvals and then bundle them all up and submit them. Uh, if you want, or you can just hold them all up until you're ready to submit the entire package to the board and then submit it to done. But that um, was the old board. That was the old committee. And then we have a new board that was seated. Right. So, so the, the new board can have a new, have a new committee meeting, decide if you want to accept or, you know, because that was from an old, you have a new committee now, boss, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So that was my question. Can we reconsider that one or no? Because it is just with the committee as yet. You're going to have to decide on that, but it seems to me that you would probably want to take it, have a new meeting and reconsider everything again. Right. Yeah, right. That's what I want to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's your decision, right? You're the yeah. chair. So you're okay. going to decide yeah. you know, what you want to do with your committee yeah. and then ultimately take what you what, what your committee supports to the board. That was my question to Glenn for now, and then we will see if we have to go to Gibson after that. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Glenn. You. Uh, let's move on to the next agenda item. Uh, I just put it on the agenda just because it used to be a normal thing, and it has not been the last two years. 
discussion regarding holiday party. I would love to have one. Obviously, we're not allowed to have one, but I just want to hear the board's thoughts of it. Um, and if we think of something, we can place it on the agenda for next week. But I just want to hear everybody out. I see multiple hands already. Uh, Christine? Yes, so I don't know if tonight is the time to discuss it or next week, like you're saying, um, or the next meeting. Um, I just want to make sure before we commit to anything, and especially if outreach is involved, that we have a committed core group of people um, you know, that are going to volunteer for this. Just Thank because you. it is only a couple weeks away and, um, you know, we're still kind of under all of these COVID just fears and restrictions with our group. Exactly. Uh, today, today, we're just feeling out everybody's thoughts and nothing is going to be finalized or discussed further other than our thoughts. And it will be agendized uh, next week's meeting if it looks like the board is positively thinking of voting on something next week. Does that make okay. sense? Definitely perfect. Randy? Yeah, as someone who's run that before, I mean, that usually takes months of planning and we would typically run it in place of our December meeting, which is December 8th. So we're talking about three weeks. So I, I don't, I, I think it would have been great if we'd started talking about something two, three months ago. I just don't think two, three weeks is, even if we did something completely digital, I don't really think it would be that that great. No, digital won't be great, and we couldn't talk. I don't think we could have talked about it three months ago because our future looked pretty dark compared to recently. It's lightening up. Yeah, really. So now it's like now it looks like there's a potential chance of things actually happening. So that's why we're here right now. I I wish we can have one. I'm not convinced we can, but I'm just trying to hear everybody's thoughts out before we even bring it up to the agenda next month I, next week. I appreciate that you're trying. I appreciate that you're asking. I just don't I I I am on the more skeptical side of even trying. Gotcha. Thank you. Gabriel. Uh, Jace. Yeah. Who that was Hilda? That's me. I heard her voice. But, okay. Yeah. So what were your what were your thinking? Like okay, holiday party, there's you could do so many things. Before, but what were you thinking? Before we used to get the hall at one of the schools and we used to have food and et cetera. Uh, we used to have singers or performers, but this year obviously we have, it's very short in time. So there's not much thinking other than just discussing the potential of thinking for an activity next month. Yeah, I'm in. Pre stage I mean, before we even discuss that. Actual we can talk about it. Yeah, of course. Why not? I mean, we can't live in fear. We have to get out of the box and right. just, you know, think positive and sanitize. Where's my sanitizer? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll offer all my sanitizers. I have a bunch of them here. Let me show you. <laughs> you aren't here, those here I got a bunch of them here. <laughs> Yeah, let's do something. If you guys want to, let's vote on it. And even if you don't, it doesn't have to be big. It could be intimate. Exactly. We have a meeting next on the 22nd. So we can always bring something to the table. But I just, that's why, as I said, I'm just feeling everybody out. Jason? Um, I, I just want to give you like a realistic context. Obviously, we don't have time to do a, a, a holiday party. But, you know, just think in terms of the event that we did get approved for was an outdoor event. And think of maybe something in the spring that's going to be outdoors, because I want to explain to you the problem that we can't do stuff indoors. And the reason why we're not going to have any in-person meetings and the reason we're not going to have in-person meetings is because we can't discriminate against people. We have to let anybody come in, whether they have a vaccine. So if somebody comes into a meeting. We cannot deny them. We can't say you can't come because you don't have a vaccine, because you don't have a COVID test. When you go to dinner, they ask you for a COVID test. They ask you for a vaccine, right? So if somebody comes in unvaccinated, you know, we cannot deny them. So that's our problem is that we have to be inclusive of everybody. But when you're talking about an outdoor event, it's a different thing, right? There's not a the, the mandate with the county is not that we have to check vaccines 
right? So you have to really look at the county mandate and the health department's mandates and what they um, require of us, because as long as we can, like the reason they were able to have that um, street fair, right? It's because it's outside, right? And so they're not checking anybody at the door, you know, so just keep that in mind. We're not going to be able to have in-person meetings, you know, for a long time because of the fact that we cannot, you know, mandate them show us a vaccine card. Like we can't do that to okay. people. We can't deny anybody. So just think about like an outdoor event, you know, um, maybe, but give some time, like in the spring or something when we have time, because you need 30 days to submit the application with the city clerk. So get the event approved. You don't have to put a date. You can put date to be determined. You know, we'll get the permit. It takes a long time to get the permit like we did at the park. We can do Holly Burnson Park. You know, it takes a long time for this stuff to get done. And then we can, you know, do all the planning. But, um, you know, we can do it. Just put the application in, get the approval from the board. But I think realistically, we need three or four months to plan out to make yeah, it. What about, what about something like calling it a snow day and hiring a company to put snow on the park right here and have like a snow day? Would that be, would that need similar approval process from the city? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Anything in the park, you're going to need a permit. And remember, we paid eight hundred dollars for that stupid permit. <laughs> I think I think John Lee would love to support some the snow day in the valley, but Just give yourself some time, you know, because it took us months and months, and they held that permit up for for. I remember. You know, I remember. Yeah, for months and months, three months at, at least to plan it. Definitely, I see Mike has his hand up, and let me go for it. Mike, floor is yours. Okay. I, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought I had to unmute myself again. But uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, fill you in a little bit about outdoor events. The uh, people are just itching to get out. And that's why the street fair alone, uh, I estimated, uh, we, we did a partial count with the chamber. Um, 25,000 people were in attendance. And it just went over really big. Wanted to let everybody know that on December 5th, starting at one o'clock, we're going to have the Granada Hills Holiday Parade. And we're setting a record number of 12 marching bands. And we have uh, over, well over 100 participants that have signed up to march in that parade. And additionally, on December 3rd, we're going to have the Granada Hills tree lighting ceremony, which is at the uh, Veterans Square, also known as the Triangle. And we're going to have uh, various politicians there, uh, John Lee and a few others. Uh, not one, but two choirs. Uh, we're going to have uh, some light refreshments, and it should be a very good event. And of course, what makes it the best is that I am it. There you go. <laughs> I mentioned, I mentioned both of the events in the beginning of the meeting. I'm glad that you're actually letting us know more details about it. And yeah, I appreciate it. you bet. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Becky? Um, one of many, we used to have um, our holiday party in, in the local restaurants. You know, that's just a suggestion for a future. And it, it's very, it wasn't labor intensive. Having it up at the school required a lot of volunteer efforts. So just something to throw out there to think about for the future. Thank you, Becky. Uh, so it looks like we're at a consensus. We would love, love to do something, but it's not something to agendize on the 22nd because obviously we can't do anything until at least a couple of months. So I love can, your snow. I love your snow idea. I do too. So that's something but, to really think about. I maybe I can just talk to John Lee about it and see. You know, he could probably push through events, and it could be we could be co-sponsor or something with it. But I'll have a discussion with him about that and present it on twenty second if I have any answers. And maybe what we can do is we can all go and support Granada Hills two events mm -hmm. next month and show our faces and. 
mingle with some of them, make new friends, and uh, move forward from there. I think neighboring city, I think we should work together on future events, and maybe we can have events up here and invite them over instead of them always inviting us there. Like I say, we have a car and we have our president and some of our board members waving at people in one of the cars. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about contacting Karen about it because I know they yeah, were Yeah, you should. I think that's a great, great idea, Gabriel. Mike, let me bring you back in. If you can let us know more about potentially having a, uh, not a float, but a car in a parade. I can get the 56 Chevy. Ah. I can get the Bel Air if you want. <laughs> To do that well as many of you know i was i'm still the past president of the chamber yeah. and uh just say the word i'll get you uh a uh, an application to fill out it takes about two seconds and uh there's still plenty of time to get you guys in so just let me know sounds good does that is there any money involved or it's straightforward nope. just application nope, it's absolutely free and how many cars does it work with? Or do we, you know, is there vehicles there? Or we provide our vehicles or anybody who wants to? You, you, you uh, provide your own vehicles. Uh, I just happen to have a convertible myself. But... Yeah. I got the Chevy, don't worry. <laughs> there you go. Okay, let me do this then, Mike. Let me uh, contact you tomorrow. All right, good deal. Oh, okay. That will be fun. You got it. Definitely. Welcome aboard. Hey, we got to work together closer than ever. This is the year that's going to bring unity for the North Valley. And you exactly. know what? This is just a thought. I don't mean to speak out of turn, but if people can't fit in, in Jason's car, they could walk next to it. And you could, I can't walk because of my knee, but you could have t-shirts on that identify us as the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. It's really cool. It's really fun. Well, I've, I've done it before. I've done they, it before, too. They actually... They actually, the uh, the chamber and the foundation, the Granite Hills Foundation, they, they work together. They actually make posters or, or, or marquees for each side of the car at, that'll say, you know, Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. And they usually list some of the people that are in the car. So, awesome. uh, yeah. Excellent. And we can have a more, we can have one or two cars or one is the you, maximum. You can, you can have. Well, I don't want to talk out of turn because I don't know if well, this they can off. do it, but oh, one for sure, possibly two. Okay, perfect. How about so, a fire engine? Fire engine. <laughs> but Only you probably driving. want to put that on the agenda, Gabriel. If you're going to do it, then um, you're going to want to probably put it on the agenda because it's uh, it, it needs to be like under the city insurance, right? So like we need to... Right. You might want to talk to Gibson about it. Right. If we're going to we're representing the neighborhood council. Right. Correct. So Mike, do you have any info on that? It needs to be okay. voted on. We got to vote on it. You know, we got to we got to do it. We I, 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 don't, I don't I don't believe it has to be under uh, the, the uh, city insurance because the parade itself has got its own insurance. There you go. Well, I'll discuss it with both you of them. You better check with Gibson because if we're putting Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council, you know, on there, it's fine if it's just like, you know, Jason and Becky and Gabriel, right? But when it becomes <laughs> Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council, you know what I'm saying? So check with um oh, well, I'll talk to I'll keep in touch with both Mike and Gibson tomorrow. But well, I think if, if, if Gibson doesn't agree, let me know. I'll make him an offer. Sounds good. You can ride with us. Yeah. Sounds good. I, I will definitely want to be there, but we'll Gabriel, have to discuss it. Gabriel, yes. I just want to add something for that tree light. Um, that park over there. Yes. My daughter's my daughter's stone is there. <gasps> so if you guys are there, it would be nice. Her name is Nataline. So that was um yeah, the Rotary Club. And Ken Cleaners, Jake, they put it together and uh, on her birthday, but unfortunately she's not with us. So, yeah, I just I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Yep, December twenty is her memorial. Yeah. Wow. Um, 
parents should never outlive their children. So I, I sympathize with you. And so do I. Thank you. My husband's there too. Glenn? So with all due respect to Gibson, um, any questions regarding liability concerns are not under the purview of Dunn. They're under the purview of city clerk. Now I realize this could open up a can of worms, you know, because of their event form and all that sort of thing. But <clears throat> just be prepared. I, I'm not saying don't contact Gibson. What I am saying is be prepared to contact uh, Paola, your funding rep, um, if you'd want to get clearance on the, you know, the parade entry. But <clears throat> I would tend to agree with Mike uh, in that neighbor councils participate by having a booth at various events that they are not in charge of. They just are a ex exhibitor. But I also realize that the liability of having, say, a vehicle is greater than just having a, a booth. So anyway, that's my two cents. Your suggestion is talking to Paola? <clears throat> uh, you, after you talk, probably after you talk to Gibson, depending on what he says, just be aware that the sign off of liability issues is city clerk in the hands of city clerk. Gotcha. It may not be necessary, but I just wanted to, you know, Dunn is not the one who's going to sign off on your liability. Gotcha. Thank you, Glenn. All right. Any other questions from anyone? I think we are officially done because. You're going to be pretty busy there, Gabriel. <laughs> Did you say done on purpose? <laughs> There's a lot Department going of neighborhood on. empowerment. That was tricky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, let's see. What is next? Next is the announcement of the special meeting again on November 22nd. And there's going to be a lot of Aliso Canyon updates during that meeting. And then we have the December 8th general meeting. And I have no other announcements. Other than I think it was a great meeting, great discussion, great teamwork, and something to look forward to in 2022 as a whole and new beginning. Uh, definitely, we all need a new beginning for 2022. Anybody yeah. want to add something to that until we conclude? I, I just want to say I'm, I'm so happy to see all the new people just get a, off to a running start and everybody's kind of found their 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 uh, niche and what they're interested in so i'm going to try and stay in my lane this year but i'm always available anytime anybody wants um, any help or questions feel free i'm happy to help with any of the new people especially thank you jason you'll hear from me <laughs> awesome any anyway i see christine has her hand up yeah, I just wanted to also say this meeting was actually one of the best that I've attended so far since joining the board. Um, it was very informative and productive, and I definitely look forward to the momentum moving forward um, and working with everybody. Thank you, Christine. Any other last minute comments? Ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. <laughs> Adjourn at 10.37 p.m. Uh, I think, once again, thank you, everyone, for coming today. And I shall see you next week. Okay. Thank you to our attendees. Good deal. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your week. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night.